So I want to call to order the Finance Committee meeting of Tuesday, May 10th. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, sir. Council Member Filsa? Here. Vice Mayor Coop? Here. Chair Du Bois? Here. For the record, all present. Great. So we got two long meetings. Um, we'll take breaks as needed. And uh, I guess the first order of business is public communications. Let's see if anybody, uh, anybody from the public would like to speak to the budget. Please raise your hand. And each, each speaker will have three minutes. And right now I see one speaker, uh, Deborah Simon. Deborah, one. Hi, I was expecting other speakers. Um, is this the public comment for anything on today's agenda? Uh, yes. Okay. <clears throat> I'm um, Deborah Simon, Chair of Friends of Coverly. We are thrilled to see that there is a budget line item for $314,000 <coughs> for FY 2026 to do some analysis and provide a plan for Coverly. We are also glad to see that funds will be used for roof replacement and other repairs in 2023 and subsequent years. As you all know, Coverly is a well-used and loved community center that has been in serious need of repair and or redevelopment for many years. We've been waiting for years for progress since the first master plan was developed and then COVID changed all of our plans. We are very glad to see that a new plan is on the map and look forward to partnering with you, the city council in any way we can in order to help and facilitate this effort. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I'm not seeing any other hands. So we will uh, go ahead and start with our agenda, which starts with a budget process overview. It does. Thank you, Chair Du Bois. Kylie Nose, Administrative Services Director. And with me, I have Jesse Deschamps and Paul Harper, um, who are in charge of the Office of Management and Budget. They will actually guide us through the next two days. So I will turn it over to them to go through the PowerPoint. <clears throat> Thank you, Kylie. Uh, good morning, council members. Paul Harper with the Office of Management and Budget. Um, as Kylie said, we're gonna be going through this over the next couple of days. Uh, we just wanted to go over a few kind of rules of the road, ground rules um, for how these meetings will progress for both the operating and capital budgets. Today, we're gonna be starting out with the capital budget uh, primarily and then moving into the operating budget later this afternoon. Um, next slide, please. And actually, next slide, please. <laughs> oh, too far. That's okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. Well, when we get back to that slide, we wanted to talk about some council policy parameters and assumptions that were um, that we have for this budget process. Uh, this budget process is a recovery period and transition. We're building on some of the reinvestments that have already been approved by the city council as part of fiscal year 2022, mainly in the Q1 um, <clears throat> financial review and the mid-year report. Uh, there were also some uh, positions added uh, as part of the SAFER grant for the fire department. Uh, this budget um, uses some one-time funding for priority services, uh, mainly the ARPA funding, the second uh, half of that that was not appropriated as part of the 2022 budget and is coming in of this year. <clears throat> We're also using the budget stabilization reserve as sort of bridge funding to uh, get us from the revenues that were low during the pandemic time to hopefully uh, a time when they are starting to come back and recover uh, in 2024 and beyond. Um, <clears throat> the long range financial forecast, uh, it uh, was presented to council back in January and outlined the need for a fiscal uh, sustainability uh, across uh, the next few years. Um, we continue to proactively fund uh, long-term obligations with ongoing funding where possible. Um, and then some preliminary 2022 revenue assumptions just to keep in mind. Um, <clears throat> we're anticipating that 2022 will come in about $14 million above the current budget based on the conservative uh, budget that was set forward uh, when we adopted it. Uh, 2023 estimates the budget stabilization reserve or fund balance in the general fund is programmed to be at about 45.8 million, which is about 100,000 above the 18.5% target that council recommends. Uh, this uh, could be 
at around 800,000 uh, if we didn't calculate the BSR on the reserves that we have already put into the budget. So if we didn't calculate the BSR on the <clears throat> reserve for um, funding those tier two or those um, ongoing items in 2024 for a second year, we would have extra money. So essentially not calculating a reserve on top of a reserve. Um, and the, the major tax revenues that are higher um, are property tax, sales tax, TOT, and documentary transfer tax. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, could you just explain that again about the <laughs> reserve? Sure. So <clears throat> the way that we calculate the BSR is we calculate it on the total uh, expense budget in the general fund. And part of that is the reserve that we have set aside to fund um, some of those um, priority items for a second year. So we have a reserve in non-departmental for about $3.7 million. And so if we didn't calculate the BSR on top of that reserve, that would give us about $800,000 of extra funding in the BSR to be used for other things. Are you saying 700,000 of it is for year two? Um, 700,000 of it is because of the reserve for year two. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so since that seems to be double counting, since we're yeah. uh, inflating this year's, yeah, that's the, exactly uh, right. The seven point, the 3.7 in FY24, is that the green uh, reserve? No, this is for those items that we've added back on a two-year basis. So throughout the budget, there are notations on certain items where we've added it back for two years. Essentially, uh, they would need additional funding sources, such as a ballot measure to be passed in order to continue funding for them beyond 2024. Next slide, please. So as of this morning, I uh, just wanted to update you on a few new things. Um, the open budget web app or the um, budget that's online uh, has been updated for the 2023 budget information. So you can go in there and look at the 2023 budget data compared to the prior years. Um, and at places memo is in process and should be coming out soon to give some general information regarding vacancies, leases and other things that uh, we usually share to uh, provide information for your decision making. Um, and a, a few things that were requested as part of the May 2nd council meeting that should be coming out soon. Uh, staff presentations for the items this morning are linked uh, in the agenda and they're online. The presentations for this afternoon and for tomorrow will be coming out uh, shortly and will be ready uh, prior to those meetings. Next slide, I'm gonna turn it over to Jesse now to present the rest of the overview. Good morning. Uh, the budget hearings on the 10th and 11th will be organized by service area and department. Uh, throughout the day, department directors and their teams will come join the discussion um, to talk about their reinvestment strategy, their major proposals, um, and their areas of focus in the coming year. An outline of the schedule, including the service area departments and estimated presentation time is included in the agenda. At the conclusion of each department presentation, there'll be time for discussion and tentative uh, motions. Um, each of these motions requires a majority of vote and includes tentative approval of an item or items, uh, recommendations to place items in the parking lot, or requests for additional information or staff follow-up. Next slide, please. The parking lot will be used as a running list of items to kind of put off to the side um, with final decisions on budget wrap um, using available funds. We'll review the status of the parking lot at the end of each day, and it will inform discussions on the final budget wrap up date. Next slide. And then lastly, um, just a few ways for the community to become engaged in these conversations. Um, one already occurred on May 2nd, the city council study session of the fiscal year 2023 proposed budget. Uh, beginning today with Finance Committee budget hearings on the 10th and 11th, with budget wrap up on the 24th, and City Council adoption on June 20th at 5. Um, additionally, ongoing conversations continue um, surrounding fiscal sustainability and other community conversations at the link on this uh, slide. And I thought that concludes our presentation.
Nolan. I was going to say, hopefully this sounds very familiar to the committee members. Um, and so unless you have any questions, we can roll right into the first item. Yep, I'm good. Everybody good? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, then we will bring up the PowerPoint again, and I think Paul will kick us off. We'll start with Capital. Good morning again. Um, so this first section, we're going to be talking about the general capital improvement funds, which includes two funds, the general capital improvement fund or fund 471 as it's known, uh, and the Coverly property capital improvement fund, um, which is fund 472. Those funds are split apart a few years ago in order to uh, specifically provide money for the Coverly fund um, and needs out there. Um, these can be found in the capital budget book. Uh, the first fund, the capital improvement fund is on pages 51 through 239. And the Coverly Fund is on page 241 through 257. Next slide, please. So this slide um, shows the funding categories in both of the Capital Improvement Fund and the Coverly Fund for the five-year uh, capital improvement plan. <clears throat> to note this um, total, the 207 million does not include things that are not project specific. Uh, for example, uh, debt service payments are not included in here. So that's why you'll see the number is slightly different on the next page when we get there. Um, just to highlight a few things on here, <clears throat> the overall budget for these two funds increased from 182.9 million in fiscal year 2022. Uh, a few of the large increases um, in the building and facilities area, it went up by about 13 and a half million. Most of this is for the new Roth rehabilitation build, uh, project that is uh, being proposed this year. Uh, in parks and open space, it went up by about 4.2 million. A few uh, projects in there are the new Bull Park Pathway Project, the Bixby Park Completion, and the Foothills Nature Preserve Improvement Project that all had increased funding over the five-year period. <clears throat> um, the traffic and transportation section um, actually went down from last year. Uh, this is mainly due to the completion or the anticipated completion of the uh, Charleston or Astrodero corridor project. Um, and then lastly, projects um, at Coverly went up uh, by about two and a half million. This is mainly for roof replacement projects, which are anticipated to be reimbursed by the school district. Um, and an, a new project that was mentioned by the public to start looking at rehabilitating uh, the Coverly Community Center out there. Next slide. Uh, this slide again just shows the pages where these are found in the budget book. Uh, next slide, please. This slide is focusing on the capital improvement fund um, itself. Uh, it's showing the revenues and expenses uh, over the five-year period, as well as the infrastructure reserve or the ending fund balance, uh, essentially the cash on hand at the end of each year. Um, as noted here, the expenses here do show uh, things that are not specifically project related. So debt service payments are here. And so that's why the expenses are at about 232 million over the five year and higher than that 207 million we saw on the previous slide. Uh, the revenues um, in 23 are higher than the other years, mainly due to reappropriated funds of about $11 million. Um, and then funding anticipated for the Newell Bridge Road project. So between those two, if you remove that, you would be back around the 30 to $40 million revenue range every year. Um, on the expense side, it's similar. Uh, there are reappropriations coming in for about $30 million from 2022. Uh, funding for the project um, for projects that are over 10 million, like the Newell Bridge Road and the Roth Building, are also contributing to that higher amount in 2023 compared to the other years. <clears throat> over the five year period, you can see that the fund balance in this fund is a little healthier than it has been in the past few years. Uh, we started about 6.1 million in 23. We dipped down in 24 to about 4.8 million. Um, and then we start to trend back up uh, going out across the five years. <clears throat> this is mainly due to the transfer from the general fund um, starting to ramp back up uh, with the idea um, that it'll be back to the pre-pandemic levels by 2026. This was directed in the 2022 budget and then continued into the 2023 long-range forecast as part of the planning for the capital 
fund. <clears throat> um, to dig into that transfer a little bit more, there's the base transfer from the general fund, uh, which is about 9.9 .9 million this year or anticipated for 2023, um, and the transfer from the TOT um, funding, which is about 9.7 million in 2023. <clears throat> to compare those to 2022, uh, the base transfer from the general fund in 22 is about 3.8 million and the TOT is estimated to be about 7.2 uh, based on current estimates. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to the Assistant Director of Public Works, Holly Boyd, to finish the rest of this presentation. Thanks, Paul. Uh, next slide. Good morning, Chair Du Bois and committee members. Again, my name is Holly Boyd, Assistant Director of Public Works. So in the last couple of years, the budget strategy has been about reducing funding to adjust to lower revenues due to the pandemic. However, this year's budget strategy is more about reprioritizing and replenishing funding. So projects continue to be reprioritized to council to address council's priorities, including the infrastructure plan projects, climate and electrification and community health and safety. Additionally, projects were prioritized based on staff workload and external funding sources. And then in this budget, staff has proposed to reestablish funding for recurring projects, including streets and sidewalk programs that have been reduced due to limited funding that was available the past two years. And I just wanted to note that while this five-year plan provides initial funding for planning and design for some major projects, including grade separation, parks master plan, animal shelter rebuild, and the Coverly Community Center, Community Center plan, the plan does not fully fund these projects. Next slide. So this year we have uh, five new projects in the proposed budget. They include the electric charger infrastructure installation with $300,000 in fiscal year 2023, the fire training facility replacement with $100,000 in 2024 for feasibility and site study, the Roth building rehabilitation phase one with $11 million in fiscal year 2023, the Bull Park pathway repaving and repair project, with $1.4 million funding requested in 2025 and 2026. And the last new project is the California Avenue streetscape update with $100,000 proposed in fiscal year 2023. Next slide. So I'd like to review the status of some of the projects that will be continuing in fiscal year 2023. So we anticipate completing the final phase of construction on the Charleston Rastadero Corridor Project, continuing construction on the public safety building and starting design on fire station number four, completing design on the New Lord Bridge Project, starting construction on Bulwer Park and several other small park improvement projects, completing the design and starting construction on the Churchill Avenue Enhanced Bikeway and the Churchill Avenue Alma Street Railroad Cross Safety Improvements Project. And then lastly, continuing studies and analysis for the grade separation project. Next slide. So moving on to the Coverly Improvement Plan. Um, for the five-year plan, the revenues include a transfer of $1.9 million from the general fund annually, as well as contributions from Palo Alto Unified School District in fiscal years 2023 and 2026. And then the expenses range over the five years from 1.6 to $5 million. There is one new project proposed, the Coverly Community Center Redevelopment Project, which includes $300,000 funding in fiscal year 2026. And then lastly, the plan includes continuation of maintenance and upkeep of the facilities. So that actually concludes the capital presentation and I'll turn it back to Chair Du Bois. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so this is the time for discussion about all of the capital projects? Yes, in, in these two funds. And I just wanted to, um, before we get into that, there were specific questions about a few projects from the um, May 2nd meeting. So I just wanted to address those before we um, started. Um, questions were on the Baylands Levy Repair uh, for Public Safety Access Project and whether that needed to be coordinated with the, the Valley Water Tidegate Project. Um, that project is actually in a separate area from the city's project. And so the city is coordinating with Valley Water, but the timing of the two projects doesn't need to be um, as closely coordinated so that they go together. Uh, the fire station four replacement project, the design for that project uh, is planned to come to council for approval on May 23rd. Uh, so in a couple of weeks. 
<coughs> the Newell Road project. Uh, so funding for that project is based on cost estimates provided to Caltrans. So the project estimates have not changed, but as they get into more of the design work um, and if numbers do change, then it will be presented to Caltrans again and numbers will be adjusted. Um, <clears throat> the Ramos Park Improvements um, project. So the design for that project is complete and the community service department anticipates bidding this project um, this summer, uh, summer 22. Um, this project um, has been charged with some administrative fees in the prior year. And so we are gonna actually probably bring back a staff recommendation to reimburse that project through the AS 10,000 or administration project um, based uh, once we get some more information from um, the community services department in terms of funding needs. So that should be coming back probably as part of the wrap up memo. And then Brad or Holly, I didn't know if you had anything to add on any of those projects that I missed. No, I think you covered it. Okay, so I guess we're scheduled for discussion through noon. <laughs> um, so if people have questions, um, I think we can just dive in. Um, I mean, I'll ask maybe a couple of high level questions to get us started. So, it, you know, it seems like there's a lot of construction planned in 2023. Would you guys say it's more than normal? And how, how confident do you feel that we're going to be able to get it all done? I wouldn't say it. I wouldn't classify it as more than normal. I would say with the public safety building, that, that is a really large project, although we, our staff is being supplemented with our construction manager. So that is taking up a lot staff time um but the other projects we've we made a lot of project or progress the last six months on a lot of the projects that got a late start in fiscal year 2022 so i would yeah. classify I mean, it as it's hard average. to tell but it, it just feels like yeah i mean maybe we're getting really good because we're doing a lot of projects right now but it just feels like there's a lot coming into 2023 it's just an impression but yeah i, I would just add to what holly said we're definitely uh very busy kind of in, you know, sprinting mode on these projects, a lot going on. Yeah. Um, but you guys feel like it's achievable, like even given supply chain issues or whatever, getting contractors, things are teed up. Well, I will have to say that some of our anticipated construction durations have been lengthened due to supply chain issues. Um, for example, Charleston Rasudero, it is taking a long time to get our traffic signal poles. So um, just those kind of things. But again, we're trying to manage where the contractors are actually being pretty um, flexible about that. And once we get under contract, we just, you know, identify kind of the long lead items and see how quickly we can expedite them. But those, those have been affecting similar projects. Similar instances of those have been affecting our projects, but we've been able to manage. Okay. Um, and then just kind of a structural question. So we have this Cubberly Improvement Plan that's kind of a separate category. Just why do we do that? Why isn't it just another capital project on the list? Why, why is it separated like that? You know? Sure. Um, so what this is and how it started is actually, if you recall the lease with PAUSD for Coverly, there was this covenant not to develop. And then when that lease was renegotiated, um, part of the direction and result of that was that the city would continue to put basically $1.9 million aside annually specifically for infrastructure at Coverly. And so in order just to account for that separately, there's a general infrastructure fund and then the Coverly infrastructure fund, which accounts for those funds that we've continued to deposit on an annual basis based on that prior agreement. Right, but we budget money for all the other projects. Like that just seems, is there any real reason that it's separated like that? Just Like I said, it's purely for clarity of the funds to make sure that all of those uh, annual contributions are reserved and dedicated towards coverly yeah. work. Again, I'm fine with them being dedicated. I was just trying to understand why we split it out like that. It, the, even right now, compared to the other projects, it's not that much, it's not large or anything. Um, and then uh, just a couple of quick questions. So fire station four, the plan is gonna come to council 
and then no activity for a year and then construction next year is set the plan no so the contract for design is going to come to council may 23rd um and the consultant is actually going to get started on the design they have quite a bit of kind of site work um studies of existing you know utilities stuff like that so they're actually going to be working on the design for nearly a year and a half oh i thought we budgeted that money last year did we just roll it all over. Yeah, so we budgeted last year, but due to pushing out the funding for construction, we delayed that starting the design one year. Okay, so, so the budget shows like nothing this year, but we're spending last year's money. More. Yes, we're spending 22 money. Okay. Okay, I'll stop there. Uh, I have more questions, but I'll let Lydia and Eric, if you guys have. Just really quickly. Sure. Just to continue the question that um, Council Member Du Bois have just with the Coverly Fund. So there's a certain amount of funding in there. We, If there needs to be work that is done, we don't just stay within that fund and not, it, it, do we exceed and go out into the general fund if need be, or are we limited just to that fund for Coverly? Uh, you are not limited to that fund. It is a policy call by the council on how much to invest in Cubberly. Um, obviously, in recent years, there haven't been major improvements, so we've stayed within that fund uh, in terms of our expenses at that property. Um, as the council continues to pursue the most recent direction of, you know, potentially looking at the land with the, the school district, as well as what the city would like to do in terms of investing in its portion of that facility, I can guarantee you we will go beyond the funds that are in that Cubberly infrastructure fund. Um, but for this moment in time, since we aren't quite there yet, we haven't exceeded it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's just curious. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, just just overview. <clears throat> what's, what's not in here? that people are likely to jump up and down about besides besides long-term coverly <laughs> i'll take a stab at that um but there's no way i will uh be able to accomplish all of them um, I think everyone will have their project that they wish was funded. Um, there are a number of projects that are not funded. Those are all outlined in our long range financial forecast of things that are not included. So that includes okay. things like um, infrastructure for public private partnerships or um, some of our aging assets like the animal shelter, uh, phase two of the junior museum and zoo. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of some other ones. The full cost or fully loaded cost of uh, train, train crossings are obviously not in here. We're still in that design plan. Um, so I'm, I'm certain that I've only listed a few. Brad and Holly probably have many more and everyone around this table I'm sure could list another, another one. Um, obviously, and that's why when you're looking at the potential ballot measures for the council, we really are looking at new for the business tax. We're looking at new investments. Um, our, our stomach and our eyes are always bigger um, than what we can actually handle. And so we don't have enough funding. And this is planned around the funding we do have, acknowledging to your point that there are still desired investments. There's no affordable housing in here. <laughs> I can tell you that. Brad, are there other well, thanks, Kylie. And, and those are the big ones, but I would just also add on, on the slightly more micro level, uh, I think over the last two years, we were forced to cut our regular streets and sidewalk maintenance on the order of six to $7 million. Uh, so this capital budget restores that to our previous level, uh, but doesn't address the fact that we've somewhat fallen behind in those areas. And I think we are getting more complaints from the community uh, about areas that we're not currently able to address. Uh, as we went through the process of balancing this fund, there were a number of projects in different areas, both in buildings and parks projects, uh, where the staff had recommended that they happen in certain years based on the condition, but in the context of needing to balance the fund and having a positive balance, we pushed things out further to where funding was available. Uh, Couple other things I would note. Uh, Holly mentioned the, the the new project for electric vehicle chargers that's going to support the uh, electrification of the city's fleet. 
that's kind of seed funding that's based on some initial studies we've, we've done about the potential for fleet electrification. And it's really starting to develop designs for facilities, but that's not construction funding. Uh, so that's gonna be coming even though we don't have those figures to include currently. Another electrification related area I would say is that the council a few weeks ago approved a contract for a, a city facilities building a condition assessment of all city buildings. And within that is also uh, assessment of facilities for electrification and developing a plan for that. Uh, so that works kind of kicking off now, probably in the next year, that's gonna result in a lot of identified uh, projects for maintenance of city facilities and maybe some fairly significant costs for moving towards electrification of those facilities. So those are just a few other examples. Then I'll just add the one that hasn't been mentioned as a kind of thumbnail, uh, our various categories are traffic and transportation projects, uh, in particular, both bikeway uh, related uh, improvement projects, as well as uh, neighborhood traffic safety. So quite quite a list of things not not in there or areas we can always do more. Nothing, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> the list wow. is too short. <laughs> Be here for a while. Um, so they start to get into the little details. Um, so there's a little bit of money left for it said punch list items on Calab Garage. Like what's what's left there? We have we have what we call some day two items. Um, some, we're gonna do some EV charger modifications and sealing of some of the concrete crack shrink, shrinkage that typically happens after the garage has been built. Uh, those are a couple of the larger ones. Those aren't like covered under the initial construction. It's just like, it's a part of the contingency that we had or? Yeah, it's just um, part of our project budget that we hold back for once the project's complete. Okay. In downtown garage, there's 5.7 million in design. Um, is that a lot of money for design? Like how much do we spend for the Calav design? Well, we did design well, build so, that, right? so the, the issue with that garage is that uh, council made the decision not to move forward. We, we were uh, close to completion of the design uh, for that garage and that project was put on hold. And so the funding that's there is, is what is available in the downtown parking and lieu fee fund that had right. that had been allocated to the project. The rest of the funding was removed uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And the current direction is to look at options for a public private partnership that could combine uh, new parking and housing. Right. So staff is working on that rather, but it's the funding is still. But we're not saying we're going to spend all of that 5.7 on additional design. No. Okay. Even though it was like in the design category. That's right. It's just kind of been left as a, for the moment, as a placeholder in that project uh, be, because the, the direction of what exactly will happen with the funding isn't yep. clear yet. And I know we changed direction a little bit. Do you think we'll be able to leverage any of the existing design money we spent? Or is that, I mean. <laughs> uh, with the current direction, as I understand it, I don't know that we would. Okay. You know, if, if we enter into a public-private partnership with an entity that's going to design housing uh, totally over some it. parking, then I don't know that they would have a, I mean, potentially, if it also was on lot D, there could be work that was done at looking at, at site conditions and utilities and surveying and, and things yeah. like that, but otherwise okay. not. I, I don't know why I was assuming it was still going to be lot D, but I guess... The council direction is broader than lot D. It allows for any public parking um, surface lot in the downtown area. So it could be lot D. It could be a combination of lot D and another lot uh, if we wanted to build housing somewhere in a parking garage somewhere else. Um, so it is a pretty broad um, direction that the council provided staff for this RFI. And so to Brad's point, I think to the extent we use lot D, we would be able to use some of the information that we've done, yeah. but it really will depend on the ultimate direction after that um, right. request for information. Well, we did do a study on like which downtown parking lots would be the best. And that's how we got to lot D in the first place. 
right? So uh, I understand what you're saying. I just, I hope that we're giving a lot of weight to all that past work we did, you know? Um, okay. Um, so I saw some money for levy repair, um, but what, I didn't really see anything for longer term planning for just levies for sea level rise or anything. So can you guys talk about that a little bit? What's the long-term plan? Yeah, so we've been, staff from CSD and um, Public Works have been coordinating with um, Valley Water and working on the shoreline phase two study um, in coordination with the Army Corps. This has been happening in the last couple of years, although just recently they're the design and studying has been going somewhat slowly and um, they're looking to, to pause for a little bit. So that's some of the work that we're doing is in that coordination with Valley Water and the Army Corps. Um, we have a horizontal levy project plan um, that I'm not as familiar with, but do you know more information about that one? Yeah, a horizontal levy, which is kind of more of a natural type levy system than a typical constructed flood control levy. Uh, <clears throat> so that one we've got grant funding for and our staff, uh, mainly from the treatment plant, are managing that project as a pilot project that might help us yeah. conceive of, of what a future levy project more broadly in Palo Alto right. could look like. But, but the I longer think, term in the five-year plan, we don't really have a broader plan yet. Or... Well, we're, it, it's probably extends beyond the five years. And uh, I think the hope on our current path is that most of that funding would come from the Army Corps of Engineers and that hopefully some of the other funding would come from Valley Water uh, as they are currently providing funding uh, in the Alviso area for the part of the shoreline study that is being implemented. Okay. So that's why we're, we're pursuing this partnership with the core and Valley Water. And you said it was kind of slowing. I mean, are we moving slower than either South County or San Mateo County in terms of levies? It seems like San Mateo County has some stuff going on as well. I'm not sure what their what timeline they're marching towards uh, in terms of actually being able to construct something. Okay. Look into Lydia and Eric. Do you guys have more questions? Um, I, I actually have. You asked a lot of it, but I wanted to find out more about the city hall space planning. <laughs> Like you get you know, nodding your head. So is there something you want to share? I mean, I did read in here that it's more, mostly about moving out, public safety building, getting being ready. And so there's that space where they move out. Um, is the plan to bring back the development center and the other location that they're at? Yeah, so the city hall space planning, the PE 19,000. Um, yeah, so the... That project will look at the existing space in the police wing after they move to the public safety building next year, as well as the fire admin space on the sixth floor. Um, so staff hasn't done a lot of work on this yet. We've, we've done inventories of the furniture and materials down in the existing police area, just as part of our PSB ff &E review. So we're using that material and information. However, we've put it on hold so we can move forward some of our other priority projects like fire station and downtown parking guidance. So we're hoping to start on it later this fall. Um, but yeah, as part of that process, we will be looking at other areas that the city currently leases space for staff work groups and see if they would be better here. Um, it's... It is it the eighth floor or which floor? So it's the um, the fire, and... the yeah, so the police wing. So uh, two levels there and then um, kind of a quarter of the sixth floor where the fire admin currently is. Oh, sixth floor is only a quarter. It's is fire the admin, the rest of it is public works. All right. Um, you know, there was this one year uh, when 
former city manager Jim Keane was still here. He played an April Fool's joke on all of us and said that the mezzanine has been changed to housing, affordable housing. <laughs> so obviously, you know, that has always stuck on my mind because, you know, yeah, it's a joke. But hey, we have the underground, right? We have all the police quarters down there. What's the possibility of it becoming uh, a shelter, right? So maybe you can think about that as you're doing your space planning. Um, Thanks to Chair Du Bois for asking about the California Avenue parking garage, because I was looking, it's brand new. Why do we still have money in there? <laughs> you know? um, AC 18,000, 18, a performing arts seats, a venue seats replacement. Where is that at? I know it's zero money here, but um, is that for the Lucy Stern seating or? So, I, I, oh. answer? so yeah, so that project right now is currently out to bid when we expect bids later this week for the children's theater. So working with CSD, we prioritize the children's theater first. So once we get the bids this week, we're going to look at them and potentially um, request funding as part of the amendment to the proposed for Lucy Stern for fiscal year 2023. So but it's, uh, will it involve the Lucy Stern Theater itself also? Yeah. So potentially both of them, depending on the bid. Yes. Well, no, I, I'm sorry, let me correct myself. The bid is only for the children's theater right now. Depending on what bids we get, we're going to, based on those bids, the work that we investigated for Lucy Stern is very similar, but we do not currently have funding for the, that Lucy Stern Theater or Cedar replacement, but we're pot potentially gonna request funding as part of the amendment to the proposed. Oh, as, okay. Yeah, so when we come back as part of the wrap up, we should have more information on how much we need. And so similar to that Ramos Park project, we'll bring back a request to add funding to that project for 2023 for the Lucy Stern Theater work. Okay, very good, thank you. I look forward to that one. <laughs> okay, I'll open that. So the, the main playhouse, again, it, it looked like the money for the seats was in last year's budget, but th that work wasn't done, right? Is that also rolling over? So the funding that's in there right now is still in there for 2022, and that's what we're getting the bid for um, okay. the, this week. And so we're waiting to see how much that is in order to base what we need for the Lucy Stern project. Okay. For the well, you said the children's theater, but you also mean the main playhouse. I'm not sure. I think those are still the old seats, right? I thought we were going to replace those seats at one point. That's what you're referring to, right, Holly? That uh, we'll do the children's theater first, then the, where the players play mm -hmm. uh, will be the next project. Yes. yes. Okay. I think originally okay. the plan was to do both, but um, we realized that there was not sufficient funding to do both. So focused on uh, the children's first. So has that been, that has not been done? We're about to bid for that. Correct. Right. Okay. I mean, so how long will it take to get to the main playhouse? Because those seats are pretty old as well. So if we get good bids, I'm hoping we do, we would try and get that contract to council before you go on summer break and then request funding at wrap up for fiscal year 23, which then we would start working on. It's a very similar type of design and then hopefully bid later this fall, end of the year. Holly, could I ask you to elaborate a little bit on the scope of work involved? Because again, I think this has been talked about, oh, and Kristen, perfect timing, talking about theater seats yes. and uh, why it's costing more and what has been involved in the project. Sure. So as part of the design, we hired a, I, I call him a historical architect, to look at the children's theater. Um, a lot of the seats are not functional um, and cause uh, safety issues while exiting, you know, if you had to exit the building in an emergency because they're just, they don't go up anymore, they're just stuck down and you can't pass. So there was a lot of work put into um, the seat spacing, the seat selection, we had um, different styles come out and have had staff for this from the theater select different seats. And then we're also addressing some ADA issues as well in this project. So it, um, it wasn't just 
a, here's a seat replacement and bolted down. It, it was a lot more effort than that. So um, I'm happy to see that it's out to bid and hopefully we get good bid results. I think also the, do you take into account the users, you know, because the children's theater, oftentimes, you know, their parents, um, and then with the other part, maybe um, broader audience, but mostly more mature. So um, like you say, it does need ADA and right now the spacing is so narrow. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it, I mean, it's definitely um, the staff from Public Works and CSD to block care in the seat selection to make sure that it was user friendly for everybody. Okay. And then ADA is re required um, just, just by coming in and touching it. We have to upgrade it to current code. Okay. Uh, do you have more to add on it, Jeff? Oh, keep going. Okay. Um, for PG 17,000 Baylands Comprehensive uh, Conservation Plan. So the 43,000 that is in the budget, is that used up um, or is it moving forward to 2023? Um, it, it's not budgeted for any, does that mean no work is being done over there to further the conservation plan? Hi, Vice Mayor Ku. This is Darren Anderson with Community Services Department. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was everybody here. So uh, when you uh, popped, uh, I was like, "Wow!" Well, uh, <laughs> well, yeah. well, um, I just wanted to share the update on the Baylands Comprehensive Conservation Plan. Staff is working on that. Uh, in fact, it will come to the Park and Rec Commission this month. And then again um, in June for a recommendation once the seek was completed, and then I'll go to council for adoption. Thank you. And hello to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. Um, so I'm, I'm sad to see that the ballpark improvements as well as the repaving and repair of the pathway is not until 2025. Am I correct in when I'm reading this proposal? This is PE 16,000 and PE 25,000. Yes, that's that's correct. It isn't until 2025. And that was just based on balancing the CIP budget as well as staff workload availability. Okay, thank you. And then at, at one point, if I remember correctly, there was gonna be traffic counts over there. Um, do you know is that if that is going to be taking place or is that also something that's not going to be done anytime soon or this fiscal year is that re referring uh, vice mayor to traffic counts that, for the bull park pathway yes uh, i know that we did a round of traffic you counts did, oh. maybe uh one and a half to two years ago okay one uh, and in, a half in support of that the parkway pathway project um, did it matter that was in COVID time or? I think it was, that it may have actually been right before COVID. Okay. If I'm remembering correctly. Okay, so if that's done, all right. Um, PE20001 City Bridge Im Improvements. Um, I, I, I don't have a problem with this. It's just that I couldn't believe that we maintain 110 city bridges. I, I, so it's like, where are all the bridges when I was reading this? But you don't have to tell me. I'm going to make it a mission to find out. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I think for now, uh, Kapali is gone. Uh, for now, I'm done with this. Thank you. <clears throat> Can I ask a follow up on, on one of uh, Lydia's questions? I don't think I completely understood the answer uh, on particularly the the police uh, part of this building. Do you folks anticipate significant capital Im expenses and improvements necessary before somebody else can move in there? Yes, <laughs> there's lots of ADA issues. Um, we need to install an elevator. 
uh, that is would be also on the list of unknown unknowns. So that's not in here. That is not in here. How, how big is the bread box? I Past estimates, which are several years dated and are very still conceptual in nature, I, I'm remembering uh, 12 to 15 million dollars. Okay, that's, so it's, that's, it's, uh, that's it's a significant was one that was too, we probably right? should have mentioned uh, in response to the question about what's not in the plant. Is there still leaking from, is there still water leaking down there? Yes. <laughs> So as you can see, there's the fencing right out here. So we have started the Civic Center waterproofing project. However, this is just replacing the joint. We have future funding in that project to address the planters that leak. And in particular, they leak over on the Ramona side into the police area. And this side also leaks? This the joint also leaks as well into the garage and it can damage the structural integrity of the deck. So that's why the, the joint is being replaced first. And then next year we've included funding and in, I think it's PE 15,020. I think that's the CIP um, to do additional design on the planters because the planters currently don't have a drainage system. They just literally drain into the garage. <laughs> so this building itself, there's gonna be some major um, funding needs. I mean, when is this building built? 1968, 67? So it's over, it's approaching 60. So <laughs> eventually, yes. Okay, thank you. So, so remind me again, what's our lease over in the development center building across the street? It's like, I don't know if it's like half a million or 600,000 a year or something like that. Um, I would have to get that exact number. I, we have it in a reference sheet, actually. Um, but we have two spaces over there, if you recall. There's um, the main area um, that's on the corner, as well as some offices a little bit further down the street. Um, we do have that information, though. I want to say you're in the ballpark. Um, so it's more than 100, but less than a million, right? Correct. <laughs> Correct. Um, and those are worked into the cost of those are worked into our development center fees. Um, so the, the cost of the rent. Um, so obviously, depending on how we use those different facilities within the city hall structure, we would also look at what the appropriate funding source would be for um, any improvements based on who would be using that space. And then last question is, at this point, maybe it's less relevant than before, but Pre-pandemic, there was sort of a lot of discussion about AV upgrades for the council chambers there, and it was a couple million dollars and so forth. Is, are, are we beyond that, or is that still sort of hanging out there? <laughs> well, we'll be getting to that this afternoon because it's part of <laughs> okay. the uh, technology fund. That's okay. where that project okay. is. Okay, like, so I'll wait for this afternoon. All right, thanks. Uh, maybe a couple small ones and then some big ones. Um, so the Bixby Park plan, um, what work is included in the budget? And well, I'll start with that. <laughs> Maybe we can ask yeah. Darren. Darren, are you still on? I am. Thank you for that question, uh, Councilmember Du Bois. This the Bixby project has got a couple of key features. Maybe the most significant is enlarging that parking lot. One of the bigger changes. Uh, it's a 120 acre area and so the other improvements are largely with native plantings, some of which will need a temporary irrigation system, some improved um, seeding, um, but I think the biggest impact you'd see is probably in the, um, the parking lot change. Okay, so it's not, not to do with the Measure E land? Um, no, it's not included. Yeah, so what is the plan right now for that Measure E land? It's on the uh, Parks and Recreation Commission work plan to discuss rededicating it. Um, and so I know they want to look into that. And once council reviews that work plan, if that stays on there, we'll begin uh, discussions on that. And I'm sure in addition to Parks and Rec, there'll probably be other departments sharing thoughts on that for council's consideration. Okay. And then um, just talked about it last night, there was some money there for golf course netting replacement. Um, is that money going to be spent or is that on hold pending this private partnership or, I mean, is it to cover other things? 
Yeah, thanks. Good question. So that money is for two things. The, this is PG 18,000 and there's funding for the netting and, and turf replacement. As you mentioned, we've got the potential partnership with First T where the netting potentially would be addressed through their project, but it doesn't address the turf. So part of this funding would go towards the turf. And then in the interim, that, that lifespan of that netting is already well past uh, its prime and it may need repairs. So the funding would also be needed or used if there was some net failure between now and, and when we eventually start the first T project, should that go forward? Okay, so you'll spend part of it on turf and then you'll kind of wait and see. Okay. That's correct. Okay. And then um, on Ricanada Park, I mean, what's what's left there? Looks like a small amount of money this year. Okay, so the Ricanada Park, um, we, we still have some work to do. Uh, we finished phase one earlier in March, but part of the funding that is included this year is installation of a new bathroom that is gonna go over in phase one that was removed from the previous plans. So that's what's gonna happen in 2023. And we're working on um, the design as well with some other park restroom projects. And then we have funding in 2024 requested so we can work on the design for a family changing room locker room and over by the pool um, area and then we have other phase funding for construction of the family changing room locker room in 2025 and then in 26 construction of the remaining phase two improvements and what, then what is that i'm gonna have i might have to <laughs> ask darren to come in for the the rest of the phase two I believe it is more pathways in, I'm trying to think, it's Southern the Park. Eastern, it's more the, yeah. the Eastern kind of towards the bay side of the park. The uh, tennis so about courts and that area. Yeah, are the tennis about, courts part of the park? They, no, so. they're on the other side actually, but I think this work is closer to the part of the park that's near them. Uh, and uh, I think it was about 10 years ago there was a long range plan completed for Rinconada Park that included a number of improvements and the work that was just done was just phase one of those. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen that, but it, I mean, it looks, sounds like it's gonna be a really nice park when this is all done. Um, and the family changing rooms, would they be in the existing pool building or be like yes, an Yes, expanded area to provide a family changing room. Did you wanna add anything else? Um, Kristen O'Kane Community Services. So I wanted to um, just add a little bit of background on the family changing room. So right now the locker rooms are, there's no privacy. And if you're um, a parent with a child who's over a certain age, but of the opposite gender, but who needs care, who has special needs, there's no place for them to um, take their child. So they've historically had to walk out of the pool area, go into the restroom, into the park and change their child. So this is um, really was a push from some community members who have struggled with the pool and choose not to go to the pool because there's no place for them to um, sort of have privacy with their older child. Um, so this we're being pretty careful about where we put it just to sort of maintain that dignity of not having to walk out of the pool and then walk back in. Um, so we're just being very careful about where we put that. Okay. Um, thank you. Switching gears. <laughs> um, downtown parking guidance project. That's really been a super long time coming. Um, looks like the money's in 2023. So do we expect it to happen? <laughs> Yes, so we are reissuing the RFP. I'm working with uh, procurement right now. So hopefully there will be a contract ready for you to approve when you guys come back from council break. Okay. So we have the operator, but we need a, somebody to build to do the construction. Well, I don't know if you, it's a long story, <laughs> kind of depressing, but we did issue an RFP. We, we got a bidder and we negotiated a contract and we actually went to council last fall to you guys to approve this contract, but they weren't able to get their bonding together. So we had to abandon that contract and start over. Okay. Yeah. Wasn't that long a story? <laughs> <laughs> it felt longer, believe me. <laughs> Um, 
so I want to talk about the bike and ped plan. I feel like I've kind of lost the thread of where we are. Um, I know, I think it's going to come to council, but um, so there's like 2 million in the budget for the bike plan. It looked like there was 3 million for Churchill bike improvements in itself, plus another 4 million for Churchill crossing improvements. And so I, 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 my question is really kind of just understanding the overall bike plan. It feels like a lot of money right at Churchill and not a lot in the rest of the city. And, you know, was there any thought to maybe spreading some of the projects out a bit so it's not all in one place in one year? I mean, I know Churchill's a lot of high school students, but I don't know. Could somebody just kind of talk to you? What's the overall like thread on the bike plan? <laughs> I know that uh, Philip Cammy um, was actually out sick today, so don't know if, oh, Sylvia's here, very good. Sylvia, are you able to take that baton? Yeah, I'll, I'll try. Um, the, uh, the projects that we're working on currently um, have been prioritized based on available funding, um, like grant funds and, and things like that. It just, um, Rip and I see you're also here too. I don't know if you want to talk about since most of them are, I think, in your shop. Uh, but in terms of the bike plan itself, um, the bike plan update will start um, this calendar year. Um, we are going to be looking in that scope um, to prioritize bike projects. And I believe that geographical equity will be something that we will be considering so that uh, we can have um, more, I think, of what, what you're asking for. Um, but we, but right now, I think what we have is a situation where available funds are, we're, we're trying to go after those funds and use those funds. Ripon, do you want to add to that? So um, uh, thank you, um, Mr. Bryce, for this question. Uh, regarding this uh, Churchill Avenue, a couple of projects that are in that vicinity, one is tied up with the, the Section 130 funding. So the $4 million for Churchill and the safety improvements is uh, fully funded through the state's um, uh, funding and therefore is, you know, um, you know, because it's a grant-based, uh, location-based, uh, so we cannot use that funds anywhere else. The other project, which is the Churchill Avenue, uh, 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 improvements, as well as the intersection improvements at Embarcadero safety improvements is linked with safety improvements as well as the uh, bike and pedestrian. Uh, it has been in works for a while and we're just trying to get this one, uh, you know, um, design complete and get the easements to, to, to find this. So, so these two projects are somewhat, uh, you know, in works and uh, in progress and therefore makes sense to at least uh, fun, uh, fully implement it this time uh, and just happen to be that they're in the same location. Okay, that's a really helpful explanation. I think, I think um, one thing to think about when we go to council is maybe adding this to the list of projects that are explained. Um, just again, we have these grants, there's a lot at Churchill. We got this bigger plan for the uh, kind of bike plan updates coming. I think just telling that story would be really useful. And again, it feels like we got a lot of projects going on in 2023. So I think part of this would be just to explain what the plan is that, so that we don't get a request for like a lot of additional bike projects at the same time. Um, if, if I could add a bit of nuance there too, that maybe is even before Ripon's time, <clears throat> you were mentioning there's not much funding in the bike and pedestrian transport plan implementation project. This is actually one of the 2014 council infrastructure plan projects. And I believe it was $20 million set aside specifically for implementing at least parts of the 2012 bike, bike plan. And that's what this uh, recurring project is. And this is kind of, it's the funding that's left out of that right. initial infrastructure right. plan. And that's, that's my recollection. We had like a yeah. huge pool of money in bikes and now it looks small. Yeah, and it so looks it's small because it's it's what's it's left, the end of and there's million. an update to yeah. the plan coming that's going to define new needs. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. I just think maybe telling that story when we get to council will probably save us all some time. So, um, the other big one um, that I, I didn't fully understand in here is the Quarry Road project. I mean, it, it says Stanford's preparing a ballot measure for modification to parkland status sounds like a big deal um it also the description says it's com 
completed, but then there's 2 million, the bike, the bike part was completed and that new is a transit improvement element. So I don't know what that means. <laughs> so it just, uh, could, could somebody kind of explain what's going on there? What's, what's the 2 million for this year? You know, what's, what's the vision there? Uh, I'll try to answer that question. <laughs> Uh, there are two part question. One is the completed portion is the by uh, I think pedestrian improvements that was done in 2018-19. Uh, they, they were completed, but as part of those improvements, there was uh, identified transit access improvements that was uh, required, uh, kind of identified at the time. However, there are land entitlements that were getting uh, some challenges with the, uh, in the process. So that's the next phase of this project that was established to have the improvements for this uh, this in this area. I'm sorry. So what what what's in the next phase? I believe there are transit connection, uh, the the access for the transit and vehicular connection from the uh, from the um, El Camino side. So we're talking about buses or cars. I, I believe that was the intent to have some uh, that, that. Yeah, thing. I think it's the connection of buses to the bus depot right there through. So it would go through Quarry and not have to use the university circle access. Yeah. So is this plan to come to council at any time soon? Everybody's looking at me. Okay. <laughs> um, I think. Well, no, not before the break. The, the conversation we've been having with Stanford, uh, given the complexities involved with the parkland undedication, um, is um, potentially to do some type of MOU with Stanford that outlines responsibilities that they're taking the lead on that the city would take the lead on. And I know uh, Philip, again, who isn't here today, um, was in conversation with Stanford on some of the particulars there. Uh, so that would be our next step. Okay. That makes sense. Sorry if I'm missing something. We were, I was quite frankly trying to figure out the order of the pages, how I could get it. But in any case, yeah, again, the, the description there, there's a lot, it seems like there's a lot more there than it's covered in the description. Um, sure. And I think to, to the point of what everyone's been saying is, is there a few pieces in motion on this um, as we are working with Stanford um, and, you know, given all of the intricacies of the ownership of the land, the, um, the improvements that have been done, the improvements that want to be done um, and, and the steps that we would need to be taking. So. so, so what is the, so I guess there's nothing this year, potentially 2 million next year. Um, yeah, what happens if the park on dedication doesn't fly? Well, ultimately, that is, I think, a, a critical piece to the project being feasible. And again, we've we've spent years uh, really evaluating that question, or perhaps debating that question of whether it did require uh, voter approval. But at this point, we've concluded that it does. Uh, and so as such, uh, really trying to put together the package in a way that makes it the most uh, viable. Okay, so I guess what I'm struggling with is, is should we ask for additional information on this item as part of the budget for the council, or should we just just wait? Well, since from a budgetary standpoint, I don't think this is really a trade-off per se for the council to consider. Uh, would suggest, or it strikes me that best next step would be again, as part of our work plan uh, through transportation to return with that proposed MOU that outline a path forward for the project. And, and I'm sorry, um, just in terms of the, to retrace the immediate next steps, the concept of a, a ballot measure being required is something that we're speaking very um, in detail with Stanford about uh, as to the logistics of how that would work, timing, uh, even a question of whether a, a fully mail-in ballot, uh, perhaps next calendar year uh, might make sense. Uh, so a number of options being explored that we can uh, present to council. Okay, I have a lot of questions about it, but probably not part of the budget discussion. Um, and then on the grade separations, we're showing the money in construction. It's like 14 million over the next five years. 
and then like nothing beyond. <laughs> um, we, I guess we really don't use that beyond five years SIP column, right? It's there, but it's always zero. Um, we use it for certain projects, but for this one, it's been more of a placeholder for funding to just use for planning. So we're not sure what's gonna happen beyond the five years, but you'll see in more of the enterprise funds that we do use that beyond the five years for, yeah. for some stuff. And again, just uh, one of the thoughts I had was maybe uh, putting putting this also in the category of highlighting the council. Just, I know council knows we spent a lot of time on planning on this, but really looking at like the cumulative costs and uh, to say, you know, we really need to get to preferred alternatives and, and we've made progress, but, um, you know, it's becoming quite a lot of money over the years. But. Any, uh, what do you, Eric, do you guys have any more comments? Last one here on uh, uh, Boulware Park uh, lists uh, projected completion date is summer 2023. Is that, is that still accurate? Yes, the design's being completed. We plan to go out to bid later this summer. So we're starting summer night, summer 2020. When do, when do we think we're going to complete it? No, so we'll start summer. We're hoping to start like fall 2022 and complete by the end of next summer, oh, 2023. Next summer. I'm up, I'm up. And not fiscal okay. year. This is calendar year. Right. Council member Phil Seth, your question about rent at the development center, the place, the corner, so 285 Hamilton is 875,000 a year. Mm -hmm. Uh, on that point, just uh, to acknowledge the funding source being a key question, whether it's general fund versus fee funded, uh, and uh, that would certainly be part of our alternatives evaluation. And just for the finance committee, um, as we're moving through this agenda today, these are agendized um, in a flexible way. So to the extent we're moving faster, then we can continue on. To the extent we're moving slower, obviously we can move things to uh, after a break or on the next day. So just um, obviously these are estimates based on the volume of information you're going through, but um, happy to move through at whatever pace the committee is ready to. I'm still curious about the bridges. <laughs> the bridges, um, you know, when they're over a creek, say for example, on um, in Barron Park, um, there are houses on one side and then there's the street and then there's sometimes a bridge that crosses to a private property. Is that also under city maintenance? Most of those ones in Barron Creek are actually private bridges and own owned and maintained by the homeowners. Okay. There could be a couple that do belong to us, but I know a few that most of them belong to the homeowners and kind of act as an extension to their driveway. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So on the Coverly Fund, um, so 300,000 for planning, what do, we, what do we think we can get done with that? And would we uh, go back to the same group that we worked with? So I'd, I'm not necessarily sure who we would go to. Um, Concordia did do a great job. I would hope that we could build off the master plan that we did a couple years ago. Um, that would be the intent. Um, we honestly, didn't really do a detailed cost estimate of what it might be to move forward with the next phase of planning Cumberly. So the 300,000, I would say is almost a placeholder for um, the future work, but we haven't scoped it out. We're not sure exactly what it would cost or who we would even go to. 
So, yeah, I, I, that was kind of my question. Yeah. It seemed like it was maybe a placeholder. But um, so again, we, we started to schedule it, but it's not for a couple of years, I guess, right? That's the idea. That's right. And that's mostly due to staffing constraints. So um, it's just trying to balance all of the projects that are on our plate and being realistic about what we can handle for the next couple of years. Okay. And then I have, I have one that's not on the list. And um, so we have, there, there's this alley in Barron Park behind Happy Donuts, goes all the way to um, the, the Buena Vista Mobile Home Park all the way. And then it turns into like an unpaved road. And apparently it's just kind of, uh, Ed's nodding his head. It's city doesn't own it. Uh, I think, I think it's owned by the county, but the county does claims they don't own it. Um, Cypress Lane. Cyp yeah. <laughs> yes. It's really bad, right? It's the yes. only way to get to a few businesses. And then you're going through these massive potholes. I know like Barron Park residents had cleaned out the unpaved portion and were like uh, people dumped like beds and things back there. And, you know, they spent like all day cleaning it out. What would it take to just resolve like who owns this alley and kind of start to maintain it? Hmm. Well, I think, well, those are two very separate questions. Um, my understanding uh, of the ownership issue is it is really cloudy. Uh, and as such, uh, before the city were to be able to make improvements, um, we would want to get some clarity on the ownership or effectively undertake, uh, quite frankly, an eminent domain activity to gain um, control of the property. And, and ha having done a, a project like that previously in San Jose, I can tell you it's a multi-year, very messy uh, effort. Uh, so that that's one question uh, and um, uh, option for resolving it. And then ultimately, if and when the city has control of the property, uh, then we would need to decide how to fund uh, improvement project and, and go from there. Uh, the other option uh, that would be perhaps more customary in a situation like this would be to uh, have an improvement associated with adjacent development. And uh, to my knowledge, there are no active uh, significant development proposals in that quarter. So uh, those are uh, kind of, a, I think, a, a fairly um, uh, straightforward uh, statement of facts, um, but how to go forward from here is a le lot less clear. Yeah, it, it, it's just one of those things that just gets kicked down the road year after year, and nobody ever resolves it. And I could see it being an issue if there was a redevelopment project. Are they going to have to wait years to figure out what happens or who owns it? Um, well, tip, tip, well, when I talk about an eminent domain action, I mean, it's effectively uh, a means of resolving open questions. So if the adjacent property owner on the El Camino Real side uh, were to want to develop it, they would presumably have at least half the uh, 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 claim on the property uh, with the residents on the other side having claim to the other half of the property. And the city would certainly release uh, any uh, claim that we had or receive uh, quick claims uh, if there yeah. were interest in doing that. So again, doing that with potentially dozens, if not more of property owners is what gets really uh, complex and, and time consuming. Um, but again, that's, that's what would probably be involved. And it's, but it's kind of like the only way that several of those building uh, businesses function, they all use that alley. Um, right. So, so gaining, let's say, again, just to walk through the scenario here, it would require assembly of the properties. So or to the extent that there are separate parcels on a single block, I, I think I'm not sure if that's very common or if it's yeah. oh, so basically under single ownership on the El Camino Real frontage. And, and do, do you know, have we looked at ownership at all? Uh, not in detail. I think we, we have just actually more seen resident provided narratives on on histories of various properties yeah okay I mean, somebody was saying it's actually county land which seems weird to be in the would it's, it be a county easement or it'd be the type of thing that was uh handed from a successor or from from one agency 
to that no longer exists to what's the next uh, agency that would be the successor agency and you know, some of those things happen and we do have a utilities easement uh, along much of it um, which is not a um, again title it's simply the right to use it for utility purposes yeah i mean i'd be really interested in trying to figure out how to resolve this issue well so i think it's it's would be a project. So effectively resourcing it with some dollars would be an appropriate step that would allow us to uh, either do it in-house or, or potentially contract with a company to do the title search uh, and um, get some clarity on property ownership uh, in order to identify next steps. So this is one where we could ask staff to maybe come back with some more information and then what, what a potential project would look like. For an estimate of what would be involved, sure. Could I ask? I was waiting for the professional way in here. <laughs> oh, no, no. I was just gonna ask, you know, and looking at it, uh, is it possible to also look at adverse possession? You know, um, potentially you can uh, notify people, uh, exactly. other property owners around there. And if nobody steps up and if they're not paying property taxes on that piece of land, that potentially there is a way for the city to take it over. Um, my understanding is that when Barron Park was annexed, somehow when they were drawing the boundary lines, they left that lane out. So um, that might be something to look at with yeah. the county also. Um, but rather than eminent domain, um, there might be the adverse per yeah. yeah, thank yep. you. So I'll make that motion that we ask for additional information on what a project would cost to kind of determine what this LA is. Or well, and result. perhaps uh, a strategy to consolidate ownership. Okay. I'll second. Okay, do, we, do you have any questions? Can we just vote on that one? Staff got 10 minutes to do it, or do we have to allocate money for it? You would need to allocate money for it. That, that's the request, is to have them estimate what the money would be. Okay, so let's vote on it. I, I, I vote yes, Eric. Yes. Okay. Okay, so it seems like we're wrapping up this part of the, are there any other motions or requests for information? So we would need then the committee to do a tentative motion to approve the item um, and the, you know, budget contained within with the additional request for information regarding as yep. you just made. So we just voted on that three. Yep. So Perfect. I'll make the motion to tentatively approve the capital improvement plan and the Coverly capital improvement plan. And I just raise your hands if you vote yes. Okay, it's unanimous. Great. Then we can move on to the next item, but might I suggest we take um, a short break so that we can switch out staff. Sounds good. Thank, Thank you. you. Five, five minutes or? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. Thank you.
Okay, so I think we're ready to resume. Um, so we're moving on to our enterprise funds, uh, capital improvement. Looks like IT is first on the agenda. The technology fund. Yep, I'll go ahead and uh, start off the section and I'll turn it over to Darren for a presentation. Um, let's wait for the presentation to pop up. And then we could probably just go to slide three, actually. So here we have, uh, similar to the capital improvement funds, we have an overview of the five-year plan for the internal service funds, which includes the vehicle maintenance and replacement fund and the um, technology fund. Uh, as you can see, the vehicle fund takes a majority of the funding in this category, uh, about 21 million of the 27 million over the five years. There's about 15 projects in both funds, nine of them in the vehicle fund. Uh, the IT fund is uh, divided into department technology upgrades and citywide technology upgrades. Um, a majority of that funding is in the first year of the five-year plan. Um, and I believe Darren will speak a little bit more to the planning for the out years on that. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Darren. If we can go to the next slide uh, for the overview of the IT fund. Hi, Darren Numoto, Director of IT. So for FY23, um, as you see in the budget book, um, we are moving just to 23, but the plan is to move forward in 24 for um, more projects moving forward. We spent a lot of time you know, during the pandemic. Most of our current projects are in our operating budget, and that's why you don't see it moving out for five years. Um, but some of the large ones that we do have on that were put on pause, the council chambers upgrade and due to the pandemic and having to pivot to hybrid meetings, um, we're gonna have to revisit our previous plans for that. And that um, we're slating to start that in 23, um, as well as um, moving forward with the CAD upgrade for public safety. Next slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, I back one slide. Um, so, and then we have a few other, projects, a lot of um, IT is involved in a lot of other projects for other um, departments as well, such as utilities, um, uh, public safety and so forth. So we do get involved in a lot of department specific CIPs as well. So, you know, resources has been, we're, has been a challenge in the past couple of years. So we're taking this year to kind of re, um, reevaluate our resources and what we can do moving forward and plan out for years beyond um, 23. In the presentation. Good. Why don't we just next slide? What I think we're walking through the whole thing, right? Why don't we just stop and do it since they're all so different? That's all right. I mean, does anybody have any questions about technology fund and IT? So I, I had I had kind of a big one, which is just um, how do we capitalize IT? in general, it seems like a really small amount of money for how big our organization is. And, um, you know, I think maybe what's going in is a lot of expenses are actually in your operating budget. And again, we've, I know we've moved a lot of cloud-based services versus like capital. So again, my concern was it looked really small for uh, an organization of our size. So how do we benchmark like what's the, right level of spend for IT. Yeah, and we have had discussions around that. And a lot of, like you mentioned, a lot of our projects are funded by our operating budget, um, especially our infrastructure and, you know, migrating services to cloud. Um, we don't have that capital investment as much anymore. Um, we do have other capital projects such as um, upgrading our internal um, systems, networks, and so forth, but those don't fit the bill of, you know, having a capital project. Those are more just out of operating upgrades, maintenance. So, um, and then of course, all of our departments have CIPs that are technology focused. So as a city, we do have a lot of spend towards technology. It's not always driven by the tech fund within IT. So it, it feels like, um... It's really opaque, I guess, maybe to, to council and to the public. Could we maybe get like an information report on like, I, I would say large 
you know, applications maybe, and that maybe breaking it out of the operating budget a little bit. Um, yeah, we it, can look at that. Okay. I think, I think again, if there's like what would have typically been capital in the past is now like multi million, million dollar, multi year contracts, right? Yeah. Agreed. And, you know, I guess the question is uh, how, do, how do you know? if all the departments are getting what they need <laughs> and maybe that'll be part of the discussion when we get to your operating. Yeah. Budget. That'll be more of a discussion in tomorrow's sessions. Yeah. Darren, uh, perhaps it'd be helpful uh, to share with the council where you are on the development of the three-year strategy or multi-year strategy uh, for it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, thank you. So um, we are in the process of finalizing a new three-year IT strategy, um, and we have five different areas of focus. So um, once we formalize it, um, we'll bring it to council for a review as we've done in the past. So, um, and that'll help clarify where our focus will be in the next three years. And we'll be using that as a basis for um, our upcoming fiscal year 24 and um, CIP projects as well and identify those. And I have had discussions um, internally with um, staff to start figuring out how we put things in capital versus operating as well and identifying those and pulling those out for more visibility. Cool. Looks like Eric wants to jump in. So, 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 so maybe this is a piece of, or what you're talking about is a piece of this, but prior to the pandemic, there was a lot of discussion, in fact, a couple of years of, you know, maybe we need to replace SAP, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, we ended up deferring that and saying, actually, we don't need to do that right away. But is that still hanging out there somewhere? Uh, as a, you know, at some point we're gonna come to a fairly major expense uh, uh, to do that. So actually we did go out to RP and we decided to stay with SAP after all that. Right. Um, we do have a phase two part of it that is part of a um, larger project. Right. Um, and that's more to enhance our systems to improve business processes and efficiencies within the system. So, and that's a fairly large um, project. We have started that work already. And that's, that's the $2 million. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. So those will be, that's more definitely professional services and things to enhance our current SAP infrastructure. Understood. And then by end of, sorry, um, I can't recall the exact date, but in a, three to four years, we'll be reevaluating the system again and ensuring that it's the right path for us. Okay, so, so the, the, you know, a potentially 10 to $20 million expense would be out beyond four years then. Potentially. To, yeah. to, to, if, if there were gonna be something like that. So do you guys anticipate sort of ongoing patching and upgrading is gonna be 2 million a year sort of perpetually? Yeah, and that's all um, within our SAP support services, and we'll be bringing forward to council a new um, contract with a new vendor to help us with those and those upgrades and those patches, you know, security patches and such for the system to keep it current. And maybe Tom already asked this, but if, and is, it, is that capital or operating? And operating. operating. Yeah. Okay. It seems like maybe our reporting is lagging behind where you used to have a big you know, license purchase with maintenance. And now it's this lower annual cost. And as I said, I think maybe we should think about how we report that out maybe a little differently to really understand what's going on. Yeah, and you know, again, it's um, the changing landscape of how companies are licensing products now over, you know, it's not perpetually where you have a big spend. Right. They, you know, amortize it and they actually do, you know, annual services, right? So, yeah. you know, for recurring revenue versus a one-time spend. So yeah. most companies have transitioned to that. Months, yeah, exactly, <laughs> yes. But if, if we were ever to swap out SAP for something else, that would, still end up being like a, a large lump investment for me. Yeah, it's not only the services, it would be the resources and the professional services required to make that to transition. Make yeah, so that would be the larger that bulk of it, right, um, yeah. especially staff resources. You know, making a switch like that is very disruptive to an organization. Anyway, but so you don't anticipate that prior to 2027? No, right? yeah. Okay. And, and you did a great job, I think, getting us into hybrid meetings. And yeah, yeah. Um, were, were the way you did that, is that those investments kind of scalable? And like, Yeah, and that's what I mentioned. So it definitely made us revisit how we can 
service chambers and even the CMR. So we were able to get this up and running within a month um, in a hybrid mode and using new and old technology. So again, that gives us an opportunity to really revisit the amount of spend we need to use to upgrade chambers to make it um, you know, ADA compliant and you know the AV a little bit more accessible. Yeah, I guess I'm asking though, the money you've already spent, is it, um... It wasn't wasted, right? It's like, it's, oh, no, you've, yeah, you've it's reasonable. Yes. Got us almost, we almost did the upgrade of, yes, already essentially. Yeah. So I, we, I was going to ask it the other ways. Do we still need to do the rest of it? I mean, the ADA, of course, right? But there are still certain areas that need to be upgraded, such as the camera systems and such the, some of the legacy systems. But in terms of how we operate the hybrid, all that could be reused in the new environment. So, well, and let me not let you stop there, though, Darren. In terms of the technology necessary for things like the city council meetings, um, uh, last night the city council had a discussion on the transition from emergency conditions to permanent next phase uh, conditions as it relates to parklets. Wouldn't, uh, as we've talked about it, the same is true with the council chambers, right? So, how would you want to um, describe? Uh, what it would take to get our bolt-on additional screens and everything that has been uh, put in place for our current emergency conditions to a more permanent um, uh, status. No, thank you. Thank you for that question. It, it's difficult to say right now. A lot of it is the screens and how we <laughs> present the screens to the public. You know, in the previous design, there was a large screen above where council sets and that would be displayed for public. Um, and that was a large um, cost. So it would be really understanding if we can put a couple screens on the sides or, you know, make it a little bit more accessible for staff. So um, that's part of the work that we're going to be entailing on. It's just figuring out what the best fit is in this new hybrid environment. Um, and then, of course, we've leveraged the use of um, mobile devices for the dais instead of the old legacy screen. So that's something we can still leverage and move forward. And um, it's not a, again, the, the investment will be reused. It, it'd be great to get back to uh, simultaneous voting since everybody's there. Yep. And uh, even since we all have the iPads, I wonder if there's some kind of software solution where we just, yep. instead of adding physical buttons. We that's just... part of our new agenda management system that we'll be looking at moving forward with. So. Yeah, cool. Yep. Um, so great work on transitioning us. Um, I wanted to find out, you know, some of the members of the public have mentioned that when we display the motions on the screen, it's very hard for them to see. It's a little bit fuzzy back at home or on their systems. Is that your department or is that actually... Um, it's something we partner with Leslie's team on making sure that display. So we have had discussions on, you know, standardizing how people share that screen because it's all shared by Zoom. So sizing and everything determines how it's displayed to the public. So, you know, we have three different audiences we serve, those who participate on Zoom, then we have MedPen, and then we have Zoom. So um, the ones who participate on Zoom directly have a little different experience than the ones who view it on YouTube and MedPen because that is actually streamed. So mm -hmm. there's always a little bit of delay when you're streaming, but overall, those are the three different audience. And then of course, in person. So um, something, thank you for bringing that up. Something that we will continue to work with clerk and monitor that for okay, more clarity. Thank you, yeah. Um, I think, you know, just they're following what we're saying, but because they're not also seeing all the wording on the screen, a lot of times they're kind of lost and thinking, what, what are you guys all talking about? And we're not speaking to the motion word for word so that they're actually catching on. Um, but thank you for looking into that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll make a tentative motion that we approve the technology fund budget. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Eric, you ready to vote? Everybody raise your hands. Okay, so that one passes. Let's move on to, I guess, the vehicle fund. So next. Thanks, Darren. Or I guess it's public. Sorry, I was looking at my agenda. So we're on the public works, right? Uh, yes, but vehicle replacement is our internal service fund. So okay. uh, good morning, Finance Committee. And this is a slide that shows the five-year CIP for the vehicle replacement fund. Uh, it's not shown on this slide, but as part of the budget reductions for the last two years, our usual vehicle replacement budget of about 3.5 million per year 
was reduced to 1.4 million uh, each year for two years. Uh, so as you can see here, it's increasing back up to, well, fiscal year 23 includes some reappropriations, uh, but basically it's in the realm of uh, $3.6, $3.7 million annually. And just to note, those uh, reductions from fiscal year 21 and 22 uh, did result in many planned replacements for vehicles being deferred, which of course uh, results in some increased age of the overall city fleet. But our fleet staff have been working closely with departments to prioritize uh, the most critical items. And so this is the big picture on vehicle replacement. You want to just finish up public works? Oh, um, just before, sure. if, if you like. Um, I think it's also important to list the major vehicles that you're looking to replace, just so that the public just doesn't think that it's any vehicle. Uh, I mean, I think in your key, key replacements would be some pretty um, valuable. I think so. There's, I think within the, in the five-year plan, there's four ambulances, fire engines, uh, patrol cars, um, all valuable to the going on and to make the city continue to function well. But I just wanted to add that too. Yeah, just taking a look, we, we don't get too into the weeds on details, but are you suggesting that when we when we uh, present this, we would focus on some of the most key vehicles and pieces of equipment? I think that'll or be valuable um, for some council members of, and also for the general public to know that Great. these are these are not just everyday sedan cars or something like that. It's also what helps the city function. And these are major equipment cars, vehicles. Okay, yeah, thanks for that. And again, uh, so is there still a focus on switching to EV as much as possible? There is, and in fact, we're, um, we had funding over the last year to do a, a consultant study on fleet electrification where they really looked at kind of the full range of vehicles in the fleet, things that are already uh, in the plan to be replaced in the coming okay. years and kind of what's out there uh, currently available. And so that study is not quite finalized, but that's part of the basis actually for uh, what we were talking about during the earlier capital budget discussion about the EV chargers installation. So we're both working with departments to, to replace vehicles with EVs where we can and trying to do some kind of short to medium term, at least for now, planning to make sure we get those EV chargers up front in the right places so that that doesn't become a barrier. And then how do I map? So you have the fiscal year 2023 um, expenses, it's 3.5 million, but then you, you show 5.4 million. What's, what's the difference? Where are you seeing the 3.5 million? So on page 572, which is the scheduled for fiscal year 2023. So I'm, council member, this is a difference between what's actually budgeted for the 2023 replacement schedule versus what has been budgeted previously. So some of the previous replacements aren't able to be completed within the prior fiscal year. So some of that money that's the difference. has been reappropriated to the to this year in order to complete those replacement yeah. schedules. So just to add, th this is a this is the standalone. It's a little bit odd, but we have a capital project, you know, kind of like the fire station project or whatever, that's just for uh, fiscal year twenty three replacements specifically. Yeah. And so that's three point five million. In the table shown on the slide, it's showing the expenses for everything that's planned in fiscal year twenty three which includes uh, some vehicles that haven't been replaced yet in from previous fiscal years, um, capital projects. Okay. And, and again, the, the replacement schedule. So we've deferred some purchases. I assume those vehicles kept operating like, um, 
so how do we determine the replacement schedule? Is it, is there some science to it? Like the maintenance costs go up more than the vehicle's worth, so we should replace it? Or do we learn that when we deferred it, maybe we could stretch some of these out further? <laughs> it's, I mean, it, it's, it's not quite that scientific. <laughs> it's a combination of, of policies we have about mileage and uh, vehicle fleet time, which for most vehicles in the fleet, we're supposed to have a 10 year replacement. In practice, we're essentially way beyond that. Uh, so it's, it's really looking at a combination of the age of vehicles and not in a scientific way, but also there are times where we're seeing that the maintenance costs on vehicles are climbing higher and higher, and that leads to them being prioritized. The 10 years, is that the, the nominal target for the 58 sedans and SUVs? Uh, and most other equipment as well, as well. I believe, is a 10-year target. Okay, so then but the some average, the the, you know, know there's different ways to calculate the average age of the fleet. Uh, I believe currently it's more in the 13 to 14 year average age. And of course, there's some pieces of equipment that that are very important, but but get relatively uh, less use than others. Uh, like like for instance, um, police oper police vehicles are replaced uh, on a seven year schedule. So, so we went so deep on this one, should we just go ahead and approve? Uh, or Kylie, would you rather us do all, all of them together? That's fine, you can approve this one and then keep going. Okay. One more question. Do you sell the vehicles? Uh, yes, when, so when we replace them, yes, they're sold for salvage value. Salvage? They're auctioned. Oh, okay. We call that salvage value. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if you saw the picture, but I was in Oaxaca. Two weeks ago, and they lined up all the uh, old Palo Alto fire trucks. <laughs> um, I hadn't seen that one. I'll have to send that picture to you. I, I would like to see it. They're all still operating. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, does anybody want to make a motion on this one? Okay, so ten move tentative approval. Everybody second. raise your hand. Yep. We don't need a second. Well, you can second. That's fine. Okay, let's let's keep going. Okay, so next slide. Uh, and so we're now shifting. We were on internal service funds, so we're now shifting to enterprise funds. And for public works, I'll I'll cover our areas. So those are airport, stormwater management, and wastewater treatment. And next slide kind of summarizes all the enterprise funds. Uh, so this is the five-year CIP for all the public works and utilities enterprise funds. As you can see, it totals about 525 million. Uh, we've also listed here the number of projects in each fund. So quite, quite a few projects overall. Uh, you'll see the wastewater treatment fund has the largest investment here with 282 million uh, over the five years, which really reflects the work we've been discussing uh, quite a bit about rebuilding the regional water quality control plant. And then kind of coming in second and third there, the electric and water funds also have significant investments and those total about one third of the total enterprise fund CIP shown here. Next slide. Uh, so thinking about the, the strategy for public works funds, several key considerations here. Um, I mentioned a moment ago, the reduced vehicle replacement budgets in previous years, and now kind of ramping back up to our previous budget. I think I didn't mention, we had decreased from 100% regular budget to 40%. So we're, we're going up quite a bit and needing to react there. Uh, really of note, the $42 million investment in the airport apron, which has been an ongoing uh, work for probably four years or so of construction, is uh, finally wrapping up in the next couple of months. So that's a big accomplishment there for the airport, uh, which allows the airport to kind of turn its attention to 
a number of other important but smaller and less costly than the apron projects. And then the uh, 2017 stormwater ballot measure that identified those kind of 13 priority projects. We're continuing the work on those. And of course, uh, a major focus on the regional water quality control plan and the rebuilding and rehabilitation there. So next slide, and we'll jump into the airport fund here. So here's the summary on the airport fund. Uh, as I mentioned, this proposed CIP is much smaller with the completion of the apron project. Uh, in some of the previous years, we've had uh, capital budget numbers more in like the $15 million range. And you'll see here, we're kind of more like one to three. So this is really great. I'll just mention, uh, as I said, to allow staff to focus on some other needed projects, but especially to support the health of the airport fund. Uh, because it was kind of tough as the city took over the airport and had this major capital need. And we're kind of trying to get our operations dialed in there. But, you know, the 10% match on $40 million is no small uh, number to fund from our airport fund. So we're done with that project. And now our local match with the FAA on these smaller projects uh, is much smaller, which is a good thing. So just to mention a couple projects that were already in the five-year plan, I don't, they're not listed on this slide, but airfield electrical improvements, the airport layout plan, uh, automated weather observation system, and some design work for runway and taxiway improvements are things that are in the five-year plan and that were already there last year. And then a, a couple of the, the new projects that we have are also related to electrification. And one of those is this zero emission vehicle replacement, which is a grant we've received from the FAA that will replace the airport's three uh, vehicles with electric vehicles and chargers to support those. Uh, we've got the airport access road reconstruction and then also related to electrification, uh, we wanna make some investment just to install electric vehicle chargers for the public's use in the airport parking lot. So that's the summary on the airport fund. Did we want to just uh, yeah, keep actually, rolling through? I have a couple of questions on this okay. one. Um, so I, I think I think there may be kind of a long term risk to the airport in terms of airplane noise and concerns. So we had this airport layout plan, and one of the things it talks about is kind of noise contour adjustments. Um, I how what can we do there to like avoid noise impacts on residents from our own airport and how, how big a part of that is is that of the layout plan i'm going to ask airport manager uh andy swanson to jump in try to speak to that andy are you there on zoom yeah. Yeah, Andy Swanson, uh, Palo Alto Airport Manager, and um, the the airport layout plan is a it's a planning process that we'll be able to to look at kind of I wouldn't say benchmarking, but on what standards what was in place at the time of the last update, which was back when the county had the airport. Looking um, into the future, looking into technologies and um, different. Um, um, aircraft like for flight training the, the whole study will look into all areas of this um i just recently last week was up uh, at uc davis is um, um noise and um, um environmental impact like symposium and um there's there's so much change in in our industry and um the newer aircraft are actually um, coming online and a lot of excitement on lower decibels and um, so looking at looking at all that will be we be done through this study and recommendations will be brought back to the council yeah I, I i don't know if you have any community outreach plan but i think it'd be wise to really maybe do some of that and really look at, at what can be done on the noise front and kind of you know, get get in front of it, and almost turn it turn it into a positive if you can. Community outreach will will be a major factor of that planning process. Okay. Yes, it is. And then the other one that caught my eye was the terminal 
rebuild, I guess. Um, and again, I think I think in the past, I, I didn't. I thought at one point the airplane, the long-term airport operating plan was going to come back to council. Um, there was some concern at one point about uh, kind of commuter um, airlines potentially wanting to use the airport. Um, so can, can you talk about like, uh, like what is the, the, the plan and how, how big would the terminal be if we rebuild the, the terminal? I'm sorry. Uh, this is airport temporary office buildings, I think. Um, it's, the, it's replacing the current terminal, if I, if I read it right. I don't think, uh, I, I think that there's been a little discussion that, that Andy and I have been having and, and others that the layout plan planning process might consider potentially replacing the terminal. But um, the, these are just small uh, okay. modular buildings. Yeah, so and, page 280. Um, this is just internal furniture to the existing modular building, is that? Yes, so we've got a couple of modular buildings that we uh, received from the school district actually, <laughs> after being gently used for some years. And we've already moved them out to the airport. Uh, and I think that there, one of them is placed next to the existing terminal building. And the thought there is to move staff into that building to allow a little more room for staff who are currently kind of crammed into the back corner of that terminal building and okay. you know, provide some more space for the public in the terminal building. The other uh, buildings are on the other side of the airfield currently and are, are mostly planned for potential uses by the airport association and some nonprofits that work out of the airport. Okay, okay, so maybe I misread this. I thought the terminal was being rebuilt itself. It, it is not, although <laughs> you caught my attention because I didn't think that was in the CIP, but it is something that, that could be a potential yeah. future project. And if I could speak to that, it definitely would be a discussion during the planning process um, to, to look at that and you know, to kind of to bring the standards up kind of for the airfield and um, bring in a, a more um, um, a more environmentally friendly facility probably for, for yeah. the long term. So that would that would definitely be part of the part of the planning process. Yeah, again, I think it's a, I think it's a pretty big policy question. Like, do we want to, um, do we want to increase the capa capacity of the airport? Maybe have it turn into something different than it is today, or do we want it for kind of private planes and lessons and things? Yeah, I think where the yeah, former mayor is going is that before anybody does an expansion, which would facilitate sort of larger scale commercial air services flying out of the airport. There ought to be a policy discussion. We're we're very sensitive, in fact, to that issue. Um, anytime Andy hears an, an inkling of something going on, uh, we have that discussion and with the city manager. So that would definitely take place. And there's nothing planned right now. Okay, that would be increasing that. So Can I sort of an interesting relationship with the FAA as a stakeholder in this as well? Yeah. I just I, I was just realizing there's an, another kind of environmental related issue that's not reflected in here, which is the discussions that have been going on about leaded fuel and unleaded fuel. And so just thought I should mention at one point, but we're working uh, currently right now with the contractor that's out there on the project through a change order to do some work in the existing fuel tank farm and get a tank ready to bring the unleaded fuel to Palo Alto Airport. And we expect to have that done in the coming months. So just wanted to acknowledge at one point we were planning to propose that as a project in here, but we found another more ex expedited way uh, to at least get the initial work to be able to bring that fuel to the yeah. airport. So that was my last question. So we're not budgeting anything for the shift to unleaded in multiple over multiple years? Not yet. Uh, it's one of the things we're going to talk about it through the planning process. Uh, but the most we thought the most critical thing was to make sure that we can just get the fuel there and start transitioning people to use it. And so basically with contingency that was available in the, um, the final phase of the apron construction, 
and that was already approved, we were able to do a change order to have the, that contractor do some fairly significant work actually uh, to put in some new uh, valving and piping and uh, bring a tank that hadn't been used for years back into service. That's awesome. Yeah. So, I'm so glad that you brought that up. <laughs> That's another one that I was gonna ask you about. So now you are offering unleaded as well as leaded. Not yet. Not the, yet. We just probably, it's probably a few weeks ago that we executed the, the change order Okay. to have the contractor proceed with that work. Okay, so it's proceeding, so, that's yeah. super. And is there the thought behind um, increasing the purchase, the price of let it fuel in order to discourage using it? That's something we've, we've started to talk with our uh, attorney who we consult with. Uh, I think so far the indications we're hearing is that that could cause problems with our FAA grant obligations. Oh, interesting. I'm, okay. I'm, there's not a final answer on that. It's a discussion that we're having. Okay. And when you spoke about community outreach, especially when um, looking into the airport layout plan, um, there's the Palo Alto community, but I think that, you know, the airport also, also affects East Palo Alto and Menlo Park, certain areas. Um, please include them in the community outreach there. Um, the other thing with the um, airport layout plan is right now, I was wondering if there's also the opportunity of um, including in, in that planning that there is a space for youth to learn how to deal with aviation, especially perhaps mechanics or uh, repair um, the running so oh, kind of like a workforce uh kind of training yeah. or opportunity oh that's an interesting idea yeah. yeah if there's space for that and um of course that would mean that there needs to be the procurement of a old used airplane that nobody wants anymore that they will donate so that the kids can tear apart you know the something like that but it would be really helpful to a lot of the youth you know to see that Area. And we have the facility, so what can we do for um, enrichment? Yeah, thanks for that suggestion. And uh, maybe for you and oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to mention that it's it's been a while since the annual airport day mm -hmm. happened, and I'm sure Andy's in the background there saying, "Tell them, um, <laughs> hey Andy." But the airport association is planning a, a airport day for yes. this fall, and. It they actually have confirmed the date, the 24th of September. So, oh. so I, I, th I think they're still in Palo Alto. I mean, so there are a lot of these new electric airplane companies. Um, have we had any requests to use our airport for a testing or anything? We, we have had interest in testing, but we, we're, we, we just don't have the space or the room for the size of, you know, the, for them to do the testing, they usually go out to larger aircraft, or air, airports um, that have large vacant spaces to use. But uh, the electric aircraft um, is it, it becoming more and more popular um, to the point where um, being able to replace a lot of the, the aircraft that use the airport daily over the years uh, will be coming. And it's 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 coming online, so that's that's very exciting to to completely shift away from from fossil fuels. So. One more question. Um, also, you know, um, we have that big parking lot out there. Is there opportunity for solar um, to get um, um, interested parties who might want to lease that for solar panel? Um, are you are you thinking of the like the public parking lot in front of the terminal building or the well, apron tie down? Yeah, areas? apron tie down. Um, and does planes want to park under a cover or um, and potentially it could be a um, electric generating um, or is there the so I don't know too much about that, but would that also be um, reflective for the airplanes when they're trying to land? Uh, I think it's yes, yes, and no. I, have, I haven't heard of the reflective, reflective being an issue. 
but we've had a lot of discussion about wanting to install solar canopies out there and, and the fact that that's actually a benefit for the, um, the air, aircraft owners who use those tie downs. And in fact, one of the things that we made sure to do during this um, apron reconstruction project is to put underground conduit all through that area that can that will support the essentially wiring uh, for for a future solar project. Mm. And and the reflective the last part of that question, um, it was a real concern um, in the early early panels, and it's not a concern now for airports. Um, to the best of my knowledge, it, it's pretty much a, not a problem at all anymore. So. That's great. Um, I often wondered, you know, with the sun shining down on all the cells and the panels, would it cause uh, problems for the pilots? Thank you, Andy. So just to sum up, I think one thing you might be hearing is, you know, the if you think about our airport and the land there, it, it probably has a tremendous uh, value. And um, just staying ahead of it as as a potentially under underutilized resource. And so I think like Vice Mayor Ku's, you know, idea about solar, which sounds like you guys were thinking about, um, again, it's just making sure that we're leveraging what, what's a pretty big piece of land that, you know, has a tremendous value. Um, so it's just, I think something to keep in mind. Utilities team has partnered with Public Works on this and done a little work um, and had a little bit of, um, even involvement from our uh, Northern California Power Agency from the uh, their generation folks. So, you know, we're we're um, aware we're thinking about that angle as yeah, well. Good. Yeah, good. Okay. As as well as the future of electric aircraft, and we're starting to think about having the electric infrastructure out there to be able to do fast charging that can support that that shift over time. Yep. Is there enough scale out there that, that can be any easier cost competitive? It is more, it's more costly, um, but, they, but because it's local, there are some interesting things that we might be able to do to get yeah. additional value out of it. Yep. Is yeah. It a lot more expensive than a linear um, It's, it's, I wouldn't say, I, I wouldn't say it's prohibitively more expensive and I'm not sure that we've, we've actually, done enough uh, review out there to really figure out how much more expensive or whether it's actually as a cost savings if you really start um, working on some of the local values that might be, might be available there. And, and again, you start to think about land in Palo Alto, it's, it really is a huge space. And if we had a lot of solar there, would we even have room for storage, you know, utility grade storage or other kinds of utility storage projects. has a much smaller footprint so yeah. yeah yes but i and i think you know when you start thinking about the other um vehicle and and um aviation needs there 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 there's probably some overlap there that could be worked out any other comments in the airport thank you so, so i'll tentatively move we approve the airport capital budget yeah all in favor Okay, moving on to the <laughs> stormwater management fund. Uh, so I think I mentioned earlier that there were these 13 high priority stormwater improvement projects in that 2017 ballot measure. So just to update the committee, we've now completed one of those and six of them, another six of them are included in this five year CIP. Uh, so there's kind of a, a group of them that are under design together and then we'll have phased construction. And those are the corporation way upgrades and pump station and the West Bay Shore pump station and trunk line improvements, which are actually four of the 13 projects. But I think all four or at least three of those are, are being uh, under design through one CIP project. So those are nearly finished with design and the phased construction of those is expected to begin this year. Uh, and then we'll begin design on the East Meadow Drive system upgrades project. And I guess we're noting here that the slide says we've got one new project. That's the East Meadow Circle connection to Adobe Creek pump station. 
Uh, of course, in this sense, it's not really a new project because it's one of those uh, 13 priority projects that were identified. This is just the first time it's showing up in the five-year CIP. So that is the, the stormwater management CIP overview. Questions or comments? Oh, I don't have any. <laughs> um, do you guys move tentative approval? All in favor? Um, yes. Okay. Okay. So on to the wastewater treatment fund. Oh, there we go. Uh, so again, with respect to the re our regional water quality control plan, uh, it's now over 50 years old. So we do have this extensive plan CIP to rebuild uh, much of the plant and meet new regulatory requirements that are coming. And kind of the, the really big one out there, largest of those projects is the secondary treatment upgrade project. Uh, we've now completed design on that and construction is expected to begin this coming winter. Uh, that's on the order of a $160 million project. So that's really the, the biggest uh, piece of this. And the really good news now, you, you might recall seeing a council item that was approved for a state revolving fund uh, loan just a few weeks ago, but that's in place, documents are executed. So a 30 year lo uh, loan to fund this at 0.8% interest. So really good news on kind of our largest of, of all the city's current current capital projects, probably before we get to the grade separation. Can we throw some more stuff in there and borrow against it? <laughs> <laughs> well, we've actually uh, been pretty successful at getting these state revolving fund loans for these projects so far. So I think we've got probably two or three of them currently that we're working through. Some of the public safety building expenses maybe. <laughs> Uh, let's see, design is continuing on our advanced water purification system project at the plant. And I think we gave an update on this uh, to council fairly recently, but we've got about $17 million as an estimate for this. And well, there's a couple of different estimates in, in different places. One's in the capital budget, One's currently what we've uh, gone to the, the state revolving fund with, but those numbers are kind of in the $20 million range. The not so great news is on, on an estimate as we got through progressing through design kind of late last year, we got a, a number that was in the low 50 millions. And so I just wanted to call out here that if you look through this document, we haven't gone and said, okay, it's now a $52 million or whatever project because we thought there were some pretty conservative assumptions that went into that estimate and we're supposed to get the 60% estimate very soon. So we don't quite have that yet. Uh, the expectation is that it's certainly going to increase beyond what we had thought before, but we wanted to, to wait and see what that 60% looked like before making changes in the budget here. Is that because of escalation in construction costs? It's or... because of a number of things. Um, first of all, I'd say that looking, okay. well, I'll start with the fact that the previous number was, was based on kind of a, a feasibility study, uh, conceptual design estimate that didn't include some factors that ultimately needed to be part of the project. So it, it was, I think, just a, it didn't include some typical uh, contingencies and other uh, costs that go along with the construction project. Uh, then in addition to that, as there was more uh, real design work going on, there were other things that were identified that needed to be part of the project that weren't looked at at the conceptual level. There's been cost escalation as, as you stated and just some higher costs estimated for even the things that had been considered and then I think that piled on top of that were some pretty con uh, conservative assumptions, uh, more conservative, more conservative than we typically use about things like contingencies and construction cost escalation and those those types of factors. That's still, I mean, it's such a big difference, though. I mean, yes. <laughs> 
Uh, let's see, just the, I so, want to so, identify. So I think I heard there was just basically straight up happy years in the in the beginning. You know, it, it's often the case if you're trying to do that kind of a, a feasibility study, you're typically not going into all the, the details of everything that ultimately become part of a project, unfortunately. But, but was there some major piece that was not included? Uh, well, let me call on plant manager, Jamie Allen, who I, I think is on the line with us here. He's, he's closest to that. Jamie, can, can you weigh in? Yeah, let me see if my camera will turn on. Uh, I can't get my camera on, but um, the, the things where Brad was saying, the sea level rise policy came out after the feasibility study, and that required more structural design to raise the structure up and put in more staircases. Um, there were the conservative assumptions. Uh, there was the escalation, the market factors, the consultant brought that to our attention in recent years uh, with the higher cost of things with inflation. Um, the original feasibility study was uh, underestimated in certain areas. They assumed the structure would not be on piles. And because of the bay mud that were uh, over here, it does need to be uh, on piles versus a mat foundation. And then uh, there's been a few scope changes as we get deeper in the design. But um, yeah, it, it went from about 20 million to 51 million. Sounds like how some of our public-private partnership partners work. So, I mean, while we're on this one, um, we so again in the budget we're showing 16 million expense. That is that after the all the partner agencies pay their shares. Uh, this is not a project that has the same type of partner agency shares because it's really. Uh, at this point, Palo Alto and Mountain View, who would use the recycled water. Uh, I, I believe the, the split for any costs beyond, that are beyond uh, what we received from Valley Water would be 75% Mountain View, 25% Palo Alto under right. the current model as we've been discussing. So I guess that's what I'm trying to understand. The, the part we show in our budget is $16 million. And then is the Valley Water 16 million on top of that plus the Mountain View share? Or is it subtracting from this? So I'll say the amount that we typically show in the budget is the full cost for the project. And the funding from the partner agencies comes in through revenue on the operating side of this fund. Okay. So last year I had the pleasure of accepting a giant novelty check for 16 million. Right, so where, I didn't see that accounted for anywhere, like even at the $50 million number, if Mountain View is paying 75% of it and we had these other funds. So if you look on page 454 of the budget, okay, um, I'm looking at the kind of the source and use that we have at the beginning, uh, right at the top where it says advanced water purification facility, there's 18.5 million from other uh, revenue sources. Um, <clears throat> that would be the amount coming from a Valley Water or some other uh, agency. Okay, but then when I look at page 466, those numbers, okay, so that's where it is uh, as well. It's right, other funding source. Okay. Yeah, it was 16 million from Valley Water, 3 million from Mountain View, and 1 million from Palo Alto. But now we have to go back to work with Mountain View and Valley Water to some extent to discuss the revenue uh, to pay for the project. Is it's a lot more than we anticipated. Got it. Okay. And what is the subtraction of the wastewater treatment fund money, the 1.6? So that's um, basically a function of math in here. So essentially um, 
more money came in up front for this project. And so the way it looks in here is that the fund is getting money back. So the positive amount in here is an amount that is needed from the fund to fund this project. A negative amount is essentially more money was paid for up front by the fund and now it's being reimbursed by the revenue from another source that's coming in. Okay, but it would come back since it's gonna be cost more than this even. Uh, potentially, yeah. It's just, this is how we balance the project year over year to balance the sources and the, the uses within each project. Okay. So if I could mention one other thing, you'll see this new project joint intercepting sewer rehab. That's kind of a funky title, but what that is, is um, the largest sewer line in the city, this 72 inch uh, trunk line that brings wastewater from part of Palo Alto and Mountain View and Los Altos uh, through the Baylands. It's uh, really at the end of its life and we found some structural issues for it. So we're kind of jump-starting the work on that and putting it in the CIP sooner than we had originally planned. And uh, you should see a, a design contract for that work coming to council before your summer break. Where is it here in the book? Is it called Sewer Rehab? It's, it's on page 474. So on yes. page 454, it's WQ 24,000 or 74? 474 is the, the project page. Oh, okay, I found it, yeah, yes. so I coordinated. Thank you. And that's what I had for the wastewater treatment fund. Um, can I ask? Yeah. So on this topic that we're talking about, the um, sewer rehabil rehabilitation, FY 2023 is zero is only because you're going to be doing a contract for design work. And then FY 2024, there's a number there. And that's when the work starts. Jamie, can you remind me why our funding is in fiscal year 24? And we're awarding the contract. Yeah. We needed to get going on design. So we're using our ongoing recurring uh, capital budget of WQ 19,002 so that we can get this contract approved uh, next Monday with Jacobs. And then they will be working uh, expeditiously to get the design in place. And then it's a revenue bonded, a revenue uh, bond for the financing, which is about 4% interest rate. So we are not going to increase this, um, the value of the bond any more than we have to. So we'll just use our ongoing pay-as-you-go money from WQ19002. And then when we're ready to go to construction, getting the, uh, the bond revenues, that's the 12 and a half million you see in fiscal year 24. Um, it would be nice to get it done and get it out to construction even sooner, but given our schedule, that's when we think we'll be able to start construction. Thank you. Uh, helps me understand why there's no money in the fiscal 23. Okay. Yeah. We're designing with a different um, capital source so that we didn't lose any time because it's a very critical project. Um, we've lost some rebar at the top of the crown of the pipe from hydrogen sulfide corrosion. Thank you. And so the plan is to kind of reline the interior of the pipe, not to replace it. Yeah. It's, it's a fiber, uh, it's a plastic liner that they heat cure about boiling point of water, they, they cure that and it's a plastic liner that becomes a new pipe inside the concrete and seals it and gives it a new lease on life. And then the outfall line construction, that one is actually replaced, right? It's a parallel pipe and then we go in and rehabilitate the joints on the existing pipe. Yeah, so the only thing that caught my eye was, was that we would plug and abandon in place the old line no, we're not, we're not going to abandon. We're going to continue using the old line. That gives us additional capacity uh, for sea level rise so that over the 50-year life of the pipe, 
will still have the same capacity even as the sea level rises. So uh, our intention is to put in a new 63 inch pipe and then rehabilitate the existing 54 inch. The 36 inch pipe that that's referring to. Oh, yeah, yeah there's voice a, is even an older I'm pipe. <laughs> yeah. There's a legacy outfall from the 30s and 40s. It's still in place that we need to seal up. It's going to be yeah. moved as part of the work. Sorry. Is it just cost prohibitive to actually remove it? Um, we'll be removing it, but like whenever you cut an old pipe underground, it's best to plug it and cap it so water doesn't move through that line that's abandoned. Okay, but so it says it's going to be abandoned in place, but we remove right. it over time or? Uh, it goes out into the balins and the salt marsh, so it'd be more disruptive to just try to remove it. And it's not a hazardous material, it's just uh, old concrete pipe, so it can remain underground, sort of abandoned in place. Okay, got it. So again, I think the big one here is the potential cost escalation on the advanced water purification plant. Um, but again, as part of the budget process, I guess there's not really anything to do now until you guys get a better estimate and come back. I think I think so, and. You'll recall we had a study session with Valley Water Plan uh, a month or two ago that was put on hold. Uh, so we're having discussions, some discussions with Valley Water uh, about the facility that, that they're hoping to build at Los Altos Treatment Plant. That ties in, in in some ways to the funding for this project. So I think ultimately we, we will be coming back to the city council and having some discussion. And hopefully by that time, we'll have the 60% cost estimate and be able to be a little yep. more firm on where we think those costs are. I mean, is there any advantage to coordinating with them in terms of who's constructing both of these plants and are they seeing the same kind of cost escalation? They haven't told us that they're seeing the same kind of cost escalation, but they're, they're earlier in their design process than we are. And that, that could be a factor that we might want to talk about if their project proceeds and this one ultimately was to, to become very, very expensive, we might wanna talk about ways to potentially partner with them. Yeah. And then um, one last question, under that agreement we signed with them, are they starting to, to pay us yet? Um, They're paying us the, I believe it's 200,000 a year, but they haven't exercised the option for the million dollar a year payment. Jamie, Jamie or Karin, can you make sure I've got that right? That's correct. It's about 203,000 now with the inflation factor and it's every year. And we share the revenue with Mountain View and Los Altos. Yeah, so that's got kind of to maintain the right to purchase the larger amount later on. And they're also paying the design costs for the advanced water purification facility. That's part of the 16 million. It's about 3 million of the 16. Right, so they're reimbursing us for that. Okay. Um, any other questions on wastewater? So, Are you still offering tours to the plant? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we sure. haven't opened up tours yet due to the COVID. We've had a couple limited tours for our partner agency staff, but we don't go inside buildings yet. But we're hoping to bring back tours at some point. I'll sign up. Okay. And we'd be happy to give our council members tours at any time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That's sure. a good, good politically correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll move ten tentative approval of the wastewater budget. All those in favor? Aye. Yeah. So it's 15 minutes till noon. I'm wondering, do we think we can get through like the electric fund and yeah. we'll stop then? The electric fund. Yeah. Good morning, Chair Du Bois. Council. So real quick, today uh, utilities will present the uh, five-year uh, capital improvement program. Um, approximately $100 million is projected over the next five, year, um, five years with a $26 million budget and fiscal uh, 23 for the electric fund. Real briefly here is that uh, start off with talking a little bit about the smart grid, um, five base stations. Um, which are receivers are been um, located. Two of them up and are actually running at this period of time. So there's two receivers on each pole. So there's about 10 receivers 
These uh, locations are located in substations and also at uh, a couple, one in a reservoir and one in a well. Um, so they're on city property. Beta phase has slipped a little bit for the next three to four months due to uh, chain supply for the meters. We were hoping to get those a little sooner. Um, it won't start until probably um, August, September, um, our beta test. And then um, <laughs> we're hoping for a full deployment that will start uh, middle of next year, 23. Um, Foothills Rebuild is continuing on. Uh, we've rebuilt about 1.4 million of the substructure work out of the 11 miles. We had uh, two bids from contractors two years ago for over $25 million. It was um, um, a, uh, a build to um, design built. Um, and uh, it was uh, the lowest was 25 mil and it was to put it back aerial. So we are actually putting it underground. So those um, basically 15 miles going up through the foothills will actually be 100% underground. Uh, we put our application in um, with the Cal ISO. We're hoping that they will move forward with their study um, this year to um, finally work on a second transmission line, 115 electric um, inner tie that will actually come out of the South Bay. So when we were first talking about it way back when, it was coming up out of Stanford. That was closed some years ago. So now we're working with PG&E and Cal ISO to actually come up through the South, which will be down off of Bayshore that will actually come in and then we'll be able to uh, get a second transmission line into the city. Um, <laughs> substation, you can see that there, we're doing quite a lot of work in our substation on upgrades. Um, we have nine substations throughout our system. We are upgrading the um, security cameras. We're also looking at uh, doing a study on putting some walls, actually building some walls. If you remember last year, there was a fire actually out at Colorado. It burnt most of the fence down on uh, the park side of Colorado. And uh, we think that uh, we should probably think about putting a wall um, totally around that area. It also backs up to the creek side where you can actually, it's not that high um, from when you're standing on top of the levee of the creek, you can almost jump into the side, uh, into the substation itself. So we're looking at that. And then um, the uh, electric grid assessment has started. It's currently underway. Um, we're doing a high level right now with a consultant. Um, the uh, grid modernization budget um, is not included in this five-year forecast. However, tomorrow we'll talk about um, the factor that uh, there are um, a rate increase beginning in 24 to fund this um, project. Um, so you will not see it in the budget as, as, as right now. So um, <laughs> we are going to delay a couple of projects. Um, by the time that the books came out, it's actually in the book right now, but we're actually going, we took it out. Um, we just can't get to it. It's a Colorado Hopkins um, four, four to 12 kV. So right now we have a lower level voltage of 4,000 volts. And we would actually convert that to a 12,000 volt. And that gives us better reliability as well as we'll upgrade that substation to be able to take 12,000 volts at that point. So that's actually going to, um, it's actually out for right now. It's not forecasted. So um, you're going pretty fast. That's the East Meadow Circles? So uh, that's actually the Colorado Hopkins 4 to 12 kV. Okay. That's on page, uh, That's Colorado. Okay, so we did take it out. So it's not in the, actually in the budget book. Okay. I thought it was, sorry, I <laughs> misread that as Colorado. And then also too is that um, the last one that we wanted to point out is that uh, we're deferring uh, underground districts 42 and 43 and deferring that design to actually starting in 26. Those uh, two areas are actually already underground. It's um, the end of life is coming for the equipment as well as the cable in those two areas. And uh, so we are going to defer that um, until 26. We just don't have the resources at this period of time with the engineering. Um, and then um, uh, we think that uh, uh, we can be able to handle that here in a few years. 
And as you can see that uh, we talked a little bit about uh, underneath the substation projects, we talked about the physical security for about $3 million. Breaker main replacements um, in the substations is about uh, $6 million. And then some protection improvements um, for about 1.8. Um, for the substation period. So with that, questions? Thanks, uh, the, the second inner tie. Yes. I thought that was gonna cost a lot more than $8 million. Was that, uh, was, it, was, it, was, it, was it always that? No, so it, it was going to cost us. It was going to cost us between twenty and twenty-five million dollars if we would have went up through that was back through that, that portion. That, that of it. was closer to my recollection. Yeah. So there actually with PG&E, there's actually one of the things that we were hoping for that other line. If you remember, um, council member was is that that was going to be a two thirty connection. So transmission costs would have been lower for us. This one's only going to be one hundred fifteen, which is what we have today coming in. Um, pg e does have an existing line that they converted some time ago over to 12 kV, um, but they don't use it that much. It's just a backup spare. And so we had looked at and talked to them about this. So with them having to do a few upgrades to their substation and for us to make the connection portion of it coming out of the South Bay, it's much closer. So it's anywhere between about eight to $10 million. I want to ask something else, sort of more strategic, but but I gather we've started to buy, you know. So hydro is de hydro is declining. I gather that we've started to buy time shifted solar from plants that use some level of battery storage in order to 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 shift it into a few hours into the evening. Is that accurate? So. Jonathan Abenshine, Assistant Director of Utilities Resource Management. Um, we're, we're still evaluating storage, um, storage facilities. We haven't actually uh, contracted for any. Um, they, prices have been fairly high for, for even small amounts of storage so far. I guess, I guess so that was sort of my, my question is that you know, somebody's got to pay for the storage and is it better us paying a provider for electricity that comes from storage, or is it better than us investing in our own storage and buying sort of off the rack electricity, right? And that's... Um, can can maybe you... Bit. Maybe I'm not getting your... Getting the... Well, so I think... Yeah, what? Like we have that um, project done in Fresno, isn't it? Yeah. And it has battery. They're going to think about putting battery. They're thinking about it, yeah. So oh, okay. their point is, would it be better for us to buy through them with the storage or... We yeah. Ourselves. So have, have the, we looked at we've that? actually evaluated both, um, and the prices have been high on on both sides. It's a it's a little it's higher nice. when you're when you, it can be a little higher when you're trying to install it locally uh, as opposed to. But again, there are some local benefits, so those offset a little bit. Um, but yeah, it, it's generally cheaper, and I think the value is there for utility scale more than more than local. So um, on the inner tie, I guess the money spread out over multiple years, but uh, well, you know, why does it take multiple years? It seems like you would connect and you'd be done. <laughs> so I, I think the reason why we spread some of this money out is, is that we don't really know. We don't have a design, first of all. Uh, we have a path that we've looked at and that we've talked to PG&E about, but we don't have a true design um, because like I said, um, we're going to have to upgrade that um, substation um, down south. Um, so there's going to be some design phase portion of it. Um, and then, then at that point, the last thing is just to make the connection portion of it. So uh, we need to work through um, those steps to get to the point where we can actually make a final connection point. So we're spreading it out, but when it happens, it would happen it's gonna, all at once. Yes. And which 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 um, transmissions or st which station is that that it would be at? Oh, Tom, Tom, are you on by chance? I think it's Adobe, but I'm not sure. That's but I want to clarify. Tom Marshall, I'm here. Hang ah. on, I'm just hitting my buttons here. Yeah, so it's Adobe Creek. I think um, the money that's in there that um, 
seven or eight million dollars. That's for the Adobe Creek connection. The actually upgrade of the transmission line, I believe, is going to is paid through the uh, California system operator. We'll pay right. that. So um, will will we have to have uh, like transmission towers once this is in place, or uh, the towers are already there that we're planning on using. Uh, they the tower existing towers come right up to the backside of our Colorado substation today. Uh, the, those lines are uh, not being used as Dean mentioned. I think they're uh, energized at 12 kV or at least one side is energized at 12 kV. Okay. So they're already in place. They actually run in that right away, sort of between um, West Bay Shore, I guess Greer or whatever. Okay. Right away. And, and then when you were talking about walls, was that just to Colorado or was that at multiple places? So walls were gonna be looked at uh, first of all, at Colorado, since that is our main substation portion. And that's when I mentioned about the fire that we had. So walls are going to be looked at there. But eventually, which is not in this five-year period of plan, is that um, we will look at um, putting out additional walls on all the substations. And this is for fire prevention? Fire prevention, and I think also just for pre um, pre um, prevention overall. Um, yes. But go ahead, Tom. I, I just say there. Uh, for security reasons, uh, I think uh, people have been looking at security more closely uh, because of what the issue that happened at the PGE e Metcalf substation. And so like a big receiving station, like for us, which is Colorado, there's the people are putting in a lot more security wall fencing and different things to protect um, the assets inside. And so think we'll be looking at the other substations later on. And then uh, on the undergrounding districts, I know we've talked about this in the past that we're spending a lot of effort basically rebuilding existing. Um, when we do those rebuilds, are we expecting a longer life than we than we had originally, like with, with new materials? Yeah, yes, we, we do. Um, the main issue usually is, are the cables out there? The original cables are good between to about 30 to maybe 40 years. The newer cables that we're using are, um, much longer life, um, exact, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 years we're expecting to get out of the new cable. Um, the other thing that we're constantly dealing with as well is underground equipment. We, in the past, we put a lot of underground equipment in, which has a much shorter, shorter lifespan. Uh, when we rebuild them, we try to get as much of the equipment above ground as we can. So I, I know it's like a long multi-year thing, but do we expect that we'll actually be able to start increasing the number of underground districts as, as the current ones last longer and the equipment's above ground? So, so I guess you're asking about conversion of overhead to underground now? Is that what you're- Yeah, I mean, yeah. my understanding is we don't really have the capacity because we spend so much time rebuilding existing districts, but- Yeah, that, I think that's part of it. The other part is you know the, the cost and I, believe the California Public Utilities Commission who regulates um, AT&T, they're looking very closely at the undergrounding uh, rules and they may not um, be funding undergrounding projects anymore through the... So what that would mean was the AT&T share of the undergrounding would have to come from Palo Alto uh, residents in some way. So that would add to the cost of doing that. So that's just another factor that have to be considered as we yep. approach new underground districts. And then at the same time, we're replacing wood poles, which yeah. is kind of at odds with the undergrounding. So what's the plan on the poles? Are we just doing so many per year, every year? So the way the poles work is we, we do a test, we test them, um, you know, once every 10 years, and that's where we determine what poles need to be replaced that are um, deteriorated to the point where they need to be uh, taken out. So that's how, typically how we do it. And we have a list of poles on that list that we work through. So it's not like geographically based district by district. It, it, well, it is geographic. And then when we do the testing, we'll go every year we go in and test a, a, a number of um, geographic areas to see how many poles are in that area. And we just work our way through town. Um, 
yeah, so that makes sense. If we do it by maps that we have, so there'd be four maps this year and maybe four maps next year, and, and we come back to those every 10 years. So again, I know maybe it's not, you know, politically popular, but it seems like at some point we should maybe articulate what the real plan is where maybe people think they're going to be undergrounded. And if we're just replacing poles and we have no real intention of ever undergrounding that area. Um, again, yeah. I think our stated policy right now is that we're going to underground everything, but we're just not really making much headway on that. Right. Yeah, I think we've gotten, I think we've come back with several reports back to council regarding the undergrounding and it, it's, it's sort of stuck right now uh, in this place where I think we would like to proceed with number of undergrounding, but we could not get participation from AT&T on the underground districts. And now that the CPUC is rethinking their rules as well, there may not be a way to get funding for the AT&T portion. So that would, if you want to go back and investigate that, we'd have to look at whether um, we would want to assume that additional cost or our, have our residents assume that additional cost as we underground and, you know, whether that makes sense for, um, you know, us to do from a financial standpoint, but that could be a discussion later on. Yeah. Okay. That's it for me. What do you, do you have anything? Um, so I was going to ask a lot of questions about the undergrounding too. And so basically what it comes down to is that when you say you bring it back, it will be brought back to council to look at, I mean, so, to, to say AT&T is not participating or not so willing to participate in undergrounding and the CPUs, what is that acronym? CPUC, um, CPUC, California. right, and they are also gonna not provide the funding toward it. So then we have a choice of either funding it ourselves or increase rates and so forth, right? Okay, that, that's so correct. that's gonna come back to council. Yes. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask um, these substations that is throughout town. Does it uh, what? What do you do to not have it anymore? I mean, what does what does it take for it to transfer all the things on it underground or say, for example, 800 High Street, didn't that used to be a, a, a substation also? Um, and then it was... So, so that substation was moved to um, Quarry substation that's out by the uh, shopping center. Oh, so it would have to be moved and combined elsewhere. Right. Not so much that there's new technology that we don't need that space anymore. That's correct. Yeah, there's, I mean, especially with electrification coming as well, there's- um, There's the, even more, more need. More need, so yeah. <clears throat> I mean, there are ways to consolidate substations, and we will be looking at it, looking at that as part of the um, the uh, second transmission route that we're looking in the city because we may need to make space somewhere, so we may transfer some of the facilities to an adjacent substation. So we'll be looking at that as we go through, um, and then we have we also have a substation at East Meadow that eventually is going to be. Uh, it's 4 KV now, we're going to convert everything there to 12 KV and we won't need that uh, station for at least serving electric load at some point. So we, we do consolidate them from time to time. Remember to save the land and keep it with the city. Absolutely. Thank you. We Absolutely. have plans for it. <laughs> okay, looks like... Good plans. Um, so I'll move that we tentatively approve the, the electric fund. Second, all those in favor. Great. Okay, so I think we're at our break. Um, Kyle, you had two hours on the agenda. Do we are we going to reconvene at two o'clock? Uh, that's if that's the uh, chair's pleasure. Then yes, uh, we can take a two-hour break. Two o'clock, we would have the remaining. 
um, enterprise funds and then uh, move on to public safety. Yeah. Uh, I mean, is that what people want to do? Everybody's here. If we want to come back in an hour, is that better? It's really up to you it's guys. Already, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's ultimately discretion. your discretion. Yeah. Well, again, I don't want to, if you guys had plans, I don't want to force you to come back early, but if you'd rather get it done. <laughs> well, I'm good with whatever you'd like, Tom. Okay. So should we come back at one o'clock? Sure. Okay. Sounds good. See everybody then. All right. Thank you.
Well, we, we'll try to keep our energy up, we tend to bog down at some point. Um, I think we're are we ready to resume. Everybody here needs to be here. Yeah. Okay, so I think we're on the fiber fund. Yeah, so moving on. So moving on to the fiber fund. Um, so we're showing that uh, the fiber outlook will be um, a system rebuild of a million dollars um, completion of the engineering design. So Magellan is um, a consultant, as you all know. Um, we are about 70% done with the engineering of the um, complete um, design. And that uh, we are scheduled to come back to council in August to do a study session with the UAC to discuss um, uh, the fiber itself, um, which would have some funding options. There'll be the survey results that we'll be doing. And then the business plan will also be in there as well. Um, and uh, hopefully by that period of time, we will be pretty close to the design of the fiber system. Um, also too, is that uh, as we talked about, I'm um, in the electric fund of the undergrounding of the foothills um, power line that runs up through there. Uh, we're also adding um, fiber, um, which then um, will go all the way to the top. We're also still in negotiations right now or having not even negotiations. We're actually talking to the customers that are in the uh, top of the foothills. This is where they were using a satellite connection portion of it. So um, Daryl Gentry, who is a um, uh, reseller, uh, we've been working with him where a DMART plate would actually be so that we can actually meet him and then he'll be able to serve those customers. So we're still working on that. Um, it isn't quite yet um, ready to go, um, but it should be coming pretty quick. And it, it has really no bearing on this undergrounding of this conduit. That's just a separate item on that. Um, <laughs> that would be like just another like dark fiber customer, basically? Yes. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. So we'll just charge them a regular rate um, on yeah, that. We're currently in the process of signing that fiber MLA agreement. So Is it mostly residential up there? Yes. 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 Also, too, is that uh, uh, we'll be discussing at that uh, study session also is looking at the dig ones, touch ready make, um, and some of the governing pieces that uh, we've been working on um, with that. So um, with that, um, also too, is that uh, we think that, uh, you know, we've been trying to get to the goal of 200 connections. Um, you see it in the, on the top, on the backside of the fiber portion of it. Well, right now we're right about 186 um, connections. Um, thanks to council um, at mid-year giving us the authorization to fill the fiber engineer position, um, we were able to do that. Um, so we do have a fiber engineer that will be coming on board for us that will be concentrating 100% of their time on fiber. And we think that that will be helpful because one of the um, uh, kind of the stopping blocks for us has been is, is that um, we've asked our engineers, our electric engineers, as they were doing engineering um, projects, then to stop, look at the um, fiber connection portion of it. So we're hoping that with this dedicated fiber engineer um, that we'll be able to move a little faster and, and actually meet our goal of those 200 connections. 200 connections means 200 customers or no? No, I, right now we have about 45, 43. So, so we have like 45 customers in the dark fiber side. However, they take multiple connections, like Stanford may have 15. Yeah, 30. Oh, sorry, 30. So they have 30. So um, those are so our counts. When we look at the count portion of it, uh, we have these resellers that go in and also have a bunch of these. So those are actually connections and they do pay separately for each of those connections. Yeah. So I think we got an information report recently, but um, in the past, I think we had seen like number of customers over time, but I don't think it was in the current report. Like, or how are we doing in terms of sales and revenue? So the last year was pretty difficult. I think we had a net loss of 45, 41 customers, 41 customers. because all of the either businesses closed up or they consolidated build, buildings. So they asked for disconnections. This year, we're a little bit ahead. I think we have a plus six right now in connections over disconnection. So it's trending back up slowly. 
So we're hoping to hire a fiber market analyst actually to help market some of this dark fiber business as well. So we are trying to grow that business. Are we, yeah, is anybody trying to sell it right now or we're waiting to hire somebody? We're waiting to hire someone. We're trying to put a rec out there to have a dedicated person similar to that fiber engineer that Dean was mentioning. We also want to do something on the marketing side as well. I was just looking at the rebuilds. Is it going to be, is it at some point going to be like how you're rebuilding the underground um, facilities in, um, mm -hmm. in what? Electric. Yeah, in electric. And will it start to kind of take over and slow down more fiber being laid? So I think that what we're looking at when we talk about the rebuild portion of it is we're, right now we, we we're re looking at rebuilding parts of the backbone, but we've actually been going kind of slow. So, you know, we have that, that main line that right now that we connect city um, um, staff areas, um, businesses, lines, and then we also have then our dark fiber portion of it. So there's a main line. And then we also have all our substations are tied and everything else is tied. So Parts of that piece needs to be rebuilt, but we're actually waiting a little bit longer on that to have this discussion in, in um, August to have a conversation about should we move forward on building a brand new backbone at the end of, of about $25 million we're talking to do that. The backbone would spread further into the neighborhoods if this is a decision that council would like to do so that we wouldn't have to lay as much con single pieces of fiber in the neighborhoods as much. Right now, the way that the backbone is said, it doesn't really go that deep into the neighborhoods. So that's the rebuild portion of it that we're talking about. I see. And then um, <clears throat> the 25 million, that's not going to be in the FY23 budget. It's just a discussion and then work it in later. Yes, because, you know, we need to come back okay. uh, to you all. Got it. Thank you. Move tentative approval. Okay, onto our gas. Um, so um, we are uh, working on GM24 as a replacement of about 25,000 um, feet in neighborhoods of Stanford Research Park, the Green Acres, um, so on, uh, Stanford Industrial Business um, Districts. And then we're also asking for GRM 25, which is another 2,600 linear feet in neighborhoods, Valley Verde, Midtown, Evergreen, and Ventura. Now you may want to think about, the question is, is that why are we going through this? Why are we going to replace basically 50,000 linear feet of gas line? So there is 32 miles of what we call PVC um, pipe that's in the ground. PVC pipe is what you have really in your own yards as sprinkler pipe. That's what actually our gas main is actually um, holding today. So the advantage that we have is, is that we run our system about 25 pounds. So it has low um, pressure. Um, so I guess the thought process is way back when, which this pipe is about anywhere from 40 to 50 years old, it's in the ground today. And what's happened is, is the glue points are starting to not be as strong as they were before. When we do our surveys, we do see that there's minor leaks that are out there, but nothing, and we will go ahead and repair them. But when we repair them, what we find is, is that you can actually pull the, part, the pipe apart. So as long as the ground is stable, we're okay. Um, so there's 32 miles of that main out there. There's about eight miles of services that are out there. So the need is, is that we need to continue to to get this 32 miles of main out of the ground. So the idea is then is that we have to start moving at a little bit faster pace to get this um, stuff out. Um, and that's the reason for 2425. And then um, gas meters and regulators, about $500,000 in the budget, which is typical um, that we would typically use on that. High, high density pipe that we've been using 
um, it's all fused together. Um, lifetime expectancy is about 100 years on that pipe. Plus, it's uh, plastic, so it's flexible. Yeah, because, you know, it, as you put this stuff together, you fuse this stuff together, so you heat it up. And then it, there's really no joints that you glue or put together. Um, so there is movement. If, if the ground moves, it'll actually move a little bit. I'm sorry, what was it called? High density. Just high density? Polyethylene, polyethylene pipe. Oh, okay. Thank you. High density. Um, yeah, I looked through it. I don't have any questions. And well, I guess once we go out, basically we'll just keep replacing this pipe. You go project 24, 25, 26. We'll just keep going. Yeah, until we get to through all of it. Yes. Eight, eight million every two years is what that looks like. That's about right. And, and how long does that go? Uh, let's see, this is okay. so Up 50, so, years, so 10. So if we're putting in 50,000 square, uh, 50,000 linear feet, 5280 for a mile. Mm. It could be, so we're looking at between eight and 10 years. So I don't want to move faster than people are ready to, but we ready to um, <clears throat> so move tentative approval for the gas fund. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Good. Let's keep going, Dean. Okay. On to the water fund. That's, that's next. Or the wastewater. Wastewater. Waste. Sorry, wastewater. So we do have some more uh, main replacement projects in this budget on the tune of about uh, 10 and a half million dollars, um, SR 3132, um, which is the areas R31 is Ventura Green Acres neighborhood again. We're trying to do this about the same time that we're going to kind of go through there with the gas um, so that we're not tearing streets up every other year. Um, so the idea was is that we looked at gas main 24 and gas main 31 kind of in the green acres area that will probably be in there um, coordinating between the, the gas upgrades and this sewer upgrade in this area. And then 32 is the areas around uh, old Palo Alto Baron Park neighborhoods. Um, <laughs> we're also uh, looking at uh, the last master plan was completed in 04. Um, studying about $400,000 in conditions assessments, looking at uh, clay pipes in the system to replace them to a higher rate. Um, and, uh, you know, we find that uh, these clay pipes, um, again, they're, they're put together by just slip joints uh, and there is seepage um, once the ground moves in those areas. So when we um, replace these, we replace this with the same type of material that we do with the gas. That's all fused together, no connection points um, at that point. Um, and we're also looking at, um, uh, we are gonna come back to finance as well as we're gonna go back to the UAC with some, maybe some funding options um, in the future around this is that uh, right now we only replace about a mile. Um, and we are thinking now to do that, it's gonna take us like 138 years to replace the sewer system as a whole. So if we're sitting track on what we try to do is that 80 to 100 mile or uh, 100 uh, miles or over the or years, I'm sorry, 100 years um, or 38 years over the top of what our current replacement rate is. So we are gonna come back um, to the finance group and to, um, to UAC to talk a little bit about what would it do is if we actually, and what is if, how much of a rate increase or what other kind of funding can we look at um, if we increase this by one and a half times, which will then get us down to around right around that 100 year mark. 
So we think that that's necessary. We're starting to see more and more failures of these clay pipes that are in the ground. Um, but again, uh, we talked to the uh, UAC, gave them a heads up over this that would be coming back to them in the fall timeframe. Um, and uh, again, that's not in this 23 plan, um, but uh, we may have to come back um, for the future years. So any questions on wastewater? Um, so the, the material use, does it withstand also tree roots and? That is correct. Yes, it will. Mm -hmm. Because again, it's, it's like a plastic, um, maybe about, I'd say maybe, maybe an inch and a half thickness of wall. And then again, they put it in a machine and they actually melt the ends together. So it fuses them together. So there's no tree, tree roots that can penetrate that. And we do that with the services as well. So we'll go from that lower, lower lateral um, and it's, it's fused at the same time. Thank you. So no questions? No, thank any, you. Any motion? Move tentative approval for wastewater collection. Yep. All those in favor? All right, great. Our last uh, utility is our water fund. Um, we're talking about uh, water tank seismic upgrades of about $16 million for Park and Dahl. Um, this is in the budget. Um, the budget is for, um, for Park for 23 and Dahl in 26. A couple more uh, water projects um, for 19 or 29 and 30 in the two um, 24 and 26 years. And then some water supply improvement um, over that. So we're replacing the steel tank at Quarter Madera um, which a which a concrete tank, and um, that tank serves some of the remaining um, items. It's almost ready to go. It's, it has water. Uh, there's a few punch um, items left to do with that, and then similar construction plans are 23 and 26. However, the thing is, is that we're actually going to go back out and get another assessment of those tanks, those two tanks, and the reason for that is that we're not really sure if um, if we really needed to take uh, maybe maybe looked at that second tank. We have had some other folks came back to us some consultants and said, you know, maybe you want to rebuild instead of actually build brand new. Maybe the tanks, the two steel tanks that we have actually in place today, um, which are those two, uh, maybe they're not as bad. Maybe what we should do is refurbish um, the inside as well as um, put concrete on the outside, um, just refurbish those. It would go a whole lot faster, won't be so much downtime, and it'd be a little bit cheaper for us to do that. So we're actually going to spend a little bit of time on this and doing another assessment on that. Um, what are these tanks? These are storage tanks? or These are reservoirs. Oh, okay. Or water reservoirs up in the hills. Okay. Um, water main 28 has increased the scope from uh, around 15,000 to 18,000, which increases the um, uh, budget by about $2 million from nine to $11 million. And then, like I said, some uh, water replacement um, improvements, uh, replacing some security cameras, high resolution in some of the reservoirs that we have. Um, we also have $2 million um, in here for generators. One of the things that we've been talking about for quite some time is that we've been debating from staff standpoint is, should we lease generators? Should we buy generators? And these generators would be actually for our emergency wells. Right now, we don't have any generators for emergency wells. We would actually, we do have some portable generators that are on trailers, but they're much larger. And we could move those in, of course. Um, but the thing is, is that we've realized that the cost of lease um, to buy is much more than actually outright buying these um, generators. Also too, is that we want to buy a couple of more larger ones to uh, uh, add to uh, some of the three pump stations in the foothills. And again, like I said, um, into the emergency wells. These would be placed at the emergency wells. They would be there. We'd have to maintain them then at that point. Um, the ones that uh, we're looking for, the pump stations would be actually be on a trailer so we could move them around wherever we would need them at that point in case of emergencies. And remind me, we have five wells, five emergency wells? Yes, five and seven reservoirs. <clears throat> so 
So there's still some money in this purple pipe water recycling project, but it's a year out. Is that just like a placeholder right now? It's a solid removal of the future, isn't it? I thought that was in the treatment plan. I thought this was extension of the purple pipe, but it's like three hundred thousand dollars. This is Karin North. Director, would you like me to assist? In sure, the question? sure. Thank so you. the the purple pipe extension, it's the project where City of Palo Alto is paying the uh, cost to extend the pipe down towards Mountain View, and also the potential we upsized it for Phase Three pipeline in the future. Okay, so it's still a real project. Um, well, it's the the payment of in the future. Okay, it's it's in the ground. It's just we used to still keep on paying for it to pay it off. Yeah. The debt repayment. So again, this is on page 504. It's only one year of one payment. Is that, we're talking about the same project? Oh, maybe I'm talking about a different project. <laughs> it's kind of in a placeholder also for the AWPS facility. That's what I thought it was. I thought it was um, the salt replacement. Not, but, you know, the salt removal facility. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's what it is. Okay. Well, that's for the salt re um, treatment plan for future. Um, it's on page 504. At the very bottom. This is our small treatment facility. This is for the water utility share because this also enables uh, really. <clears throat> this is for the water utility share because this also enables future construction if we were able to do it of right. our own purple pipe network. Yep. And so the the these upgrades of the tanks, do you, you again, uh, we expect to be able to get that done this year. That is correct. The idea is, is to um, spend these dollars in this year's 23 budget um, to do this uh, actual assessment. So there, let's, is it already underway? Or, no, no, not yet. Um, we are drafting the um, scope of work um, to be sent out. Okay. Any other questions? <clears throat> Do you salvage fire hydrants too? Salvage or sell off, or do you just dump it? <laughs> I don't know. Do we salvage? I, I'm just. Uh, I know that we. I know that we save them, and yes, we do. There's a salvage company that that we actually salvage that brass because most of that's all brass on the inside um, of those fire hydrants. We usually have a dumpster once we fill it then we have a deal and those what those uh, dollars then come back to us. Oh, that's cool. I didn't realize there are brass on the inside. Yeah, the, the internal pieces are, are brass. Wow, thank you. Now I'm finished with my question. Okay. Seeing, seeing no more questions, so move tentative approval of the water fund. Everybody in favor? All right, great. So it passes 3 0. Thank you on the enterprise funds. And then um, I guess we're moving on to the SCAP. Yes. Thanks, Dave. Go ahead, John. And I'll just try and do a little bit of scene setting. There are, uh, as we are ramping up investments on the council's priority of sustainability and climate action. Um, we just have tried to begin to highlight the investments that are happening across departments. And 
there's no perfect place to put this. It primarily hits public works and utilities. There are some capital projects, there are some operating projects. So this was really just um, an overlay for lack of a better term to allow the committee some time to really understand um, the investments that have already been improved for and resources, I should say, for sustainability and then the ones that are forthcoming as part of this proposed. So these amounts are appear in other places in the correct okay. so these amounts yeah show up throughout both documents frankly um in primarily the utilities and public works departments um but again just acknowledging that it's a thousand pages of information and this is a high priority that is um across many 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 departments all right and i think jonathan abenstein is gonna try and walk us through this Thanks. Jonathan Abenshine, Assistant Director of Utilities Resource Management. Uh, so the page numbers that you see up there on the screen um, are the, the ones with the clear descriptions of the, the changes being requested in FY 2023. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I am with utilities. I'm here also as part of the SCAP leadership team uh, with, um, with Brad Eggleston, uh, Public Works Director leading that team. Um, can I get the next slide, please? So <clears throat> when the council formed the SCAP committee last year, um, one of the major focuses was on the resources needed for the SCAP. Um, council approved a first round of resource requests at mid-year in FY 2022, and those are listed up here on the slide. Um, the major focus of the this, this first round of mid-year investments was on sustainability, uh, or sorry, it was on the um, leadership of the overall sustainability and climate action plan, which is, uh, which is a, an effort as Kylie noted, takes, uh, takes part across uh, many different departments and divisions within the city. Um, it also focused on uh, primarily on uh, engineering and operations within the utility, uh, on upgrading infrastructure to be able to accommodate building electrification and, um, and electric vehicles. There's also some support in there for non-residential electric building effect, uh, electric, uh, sorry, building electrification in the form of that utility program services manager. I think it's worth noting that the engineering and operational changes uh, only to, uh, were only represented part of the effort that, that's needed in order to um, prepare the electric grid. There are uh, the SCAP committee is continuing to talk about things like um, recruitment and retention challenges, supply chain issues, and uh, how quickly the grid can be upgraded, and, and most importantly, what sorts of technologies could be used to minimize the need for grid upgrades. The, um, so this was FY22 mid-year. Uh, for the FY2023 budget, the, um, the proposals are more focused on staffing and budgets uh, to support actual electrification and EV programs. Unlike the mid-year proposals, the FY2023 budget uh, proposals are mostly offset by outside revenues that are um, primarily um, uh, restricted to be directly used for emissions reduction. Things like the state's cap and trade program and low carbon fuel standard programs, uh, we're able to get um, revenue for emissions reductions through our participation in both of those. Next slide, please. Previous slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> All right, staff is proposing. Uh, so these are the specific proposals. Uh, there's a net 1.5 FTE increase that's shown in the budget uh, that primarily includes additional line staff to um, to actually run programs to address building electrification, EV adoption, and then these SCAP uh, water related programs as well, uh, including um, a $2.8 million budget for non-salary budget for launching for ex both existing programs and for launching these new programs. Um, particularly, uh, in, in, and that's in both residential and non-residential buildings. There's one more position uh, that's not listed here that's under consideration. It'll likely be put in at places tomorrow and that would uh, a principal utilities program manager and that'll bring, the, the, bring it to a net 2.5 .5 FTE increase. Um, the principal would provide capacity for um, strategic planning 
and utilities uh, of program needs and would serve as a central utilities coordinator across the different divisions and work groups and coordinator with utilities across other department uh, with other departments for electrification, EV charging and, and grid modernization activities. Um, the electric distribution system and grid modernization study is, is underway and it's funded, but there are no specific capital projects added um, related to electric grid upgrades yet. And then I just wanted to note the, the SCAP does go across many areas. Um, it goes across both climate, climate action uh, and sustainability. Within climate action, it goes across alternative transportation, EVs and, and um, building electrification. There aren't uh, funds listed in this budget for alternative transportation. Um, I'm unsure about PDS staffing to support the SCAP and then administrative support, technology, recruitments, contracts and legal. Uh, next slide, please. And this slide lists some of the FY2023 efforts included in the SCAP. It's a really long list. I'm not going to go through all of it. I just want to emphasize that the SCAP includes a lot of water related, tree canopy related, and zero waste related efforts in addition to the climate action areas. Uh, for climate action, the exact work plan is still under discussion with the SCAP committee, but it's expected to include both programs and ordinances to encourage building electrification, enhance existing EV programs, and then focus on the infrastructure investment that's needed and the electric grid especially to support these efforts. Uh, alternative transportation, again, ex expected to focus on core existing programs right now. And that's what I have. Thank you. Is, uh, the positions that you mentioned, um, the FY, so the 5.25 position has already been approved. In the mid-year, yes. Yes, okay. So what you what is being proposed now is the 2.5 positions. That's, that's right. Uh, and it's 1.5. 1. 1.5 1. is what you'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, there, and there will be an additional one at places tomorrow. Just, just to clarify, so those are those mid-years, are we seeing those again? I mean, so are we seeing 7.75? So correct, correct me if I see anything wrong, but they're included in the mid-year and they almost, they look, or they're included in the budget and they almost look like additions because they are, because it's a change from last year's budget to this year's budget, but they were already approved, right? That's correct. So in the department sections, it'll show up in the budget reconciliation. Um, it won't show up under proposals, but it will show up as an adjustment from last year's adopted to this year's proposed since it was a mid-year, uh, midstream adjustment. Um, okay. So it doesn't need council approval. It's part of our base budget. Uh, but it is important to note, obviously, because that is going to be your year over year change in um, authorized staffing. And this is how this is part of the increase to the 39 positions. No, this would be in addition to the 39. The mid year positions are not included in that 39 because councils already approved them. And that the, was the 20, the 20. Correct. Yeah, so, so that's the 20 that's already been approved. And then this proposed budget recommends another 39. Um, and so there's a nice summary of that um, in attachment B of the operating budget transmittal letter that kind of tries to walk one through um, by general fund, enterprise funds and um, other funds, kind of what was our 2022 adopted staffing level? What are the adjustments that we've made thus far this fiscal year? What are the adjustments recommended by the city council or by um, staff as part of this proposed budget? And so what would your new 2023 staffing levels be? And so really what's under consideration by the committee as part of these meetings is that last piece, those proposed changes for FY 2023 um, that the council nor committee have reviewed previously. So the last slide, <laughs> if you go back one slide. <laughs> That's what is, uh, those are the additional add-ons for SCAP resources. And this falls into the 39 employees. That's correct. The 5.2 falls into the 20 employees. Correct. Thank you. I you got it. Now. <laughs> so how do we think about uh, these SCAP positions? I mean, they're just, uh, isn't like everybody doing a little bit on the SCAP or are these people 100% dedicated to climate action or? Yeah, no, I can speak yeah. to that. So one of the things we did as we started developing a, a draft work plan is, is 
um, actually go through first and, and look for capacity within existing um, uh, work groups and look where we could overlay new programs into existing programs for efficient efficiency reasons. And we actually came out with fewer resource requests, I think, than, than I'd actually anticipated when we were first looking at the magnitude of this effort. Um, so the positions that you see here are, um, uh, they're, they're in effect, yes, working entirely on uh, SCAP related work, but in reality, the work will be distributed among a lot of different people. This is this just represents the aggregated capacity that's needed, um, and so work will you know will sort of be distributed according to the right places um, based on these FTE. Okay. So, I can also add to this is that the importance of this principal position for ourselves. So Jonathan's been on an upgrade working on the SCAP 100% of the time. We've had to upgrade Carla into his existing AD position. Can't do both. There's just way too much movements that are going on. So the idea with this principle that we're asking for is actually to bring Jonathan back to his AD position and have this person that is going to be the principal that would be working with Brad and Brad's team on dealing with the SCAP. But, but again, we'll... Jonathan spent some time on the SCAP. It's like a little bit, I mean, as these programs become our main programs, it feels like everybody will be working on it, you know, to some degree, I guess, as part of their normal job. Sure. Sustainability. Well, I mean, a good example is a sustainability program administrator, for example. Um, we don't have any specific electrification program that needs 1.0 FTE. So um, that person, uh, the, the person we hire into that position will, will likely be doing some electrification work, but they may also be doing some energy efficiency work. Uh, for example, it makes sense if you have, uh, if you're, if you're trying to reach single family homeowners and you're, and you're trying to reach them for electric efficiency, water efficiency, and, uh, and building electrification and electric vehicles, you want to be doing that all through one channel. And so that person will probably be handling a range of programs, but we do need 1.0 FTE of staff capacity to manage all of our existing work plus these yep. new programs. Okay. So that might be the way to think about it. Yeah. And then, so again, just thinking about grid modernization in this budget, like we talked about the rates at finance and we started to build the bonds into those rates, right? But then does this budget really include the cost for, uh, you said no before, right? So yeah, can you just kind of walk through that again? So we, we have those bonds, those are coming in in the out years. And then I guess in future budgets, we'll start to see projects that spend that money. Is that the way it'll work? Yeah, so tomorrow when we talk about rates, you'll see the increased portion of it for the outer years. I think also too is that we're doing the cost of service um, on the electric side and we're hoping to have that done by year end. Um, at that period of time, one of the um, uh, items that we actually put in there in the scope of work was to look at this grid monetization and what it would take of what that increase might look like. Plus also too, is that uh, we kind of know already that we're, we think pretty strongly that $150 million to $200 million is gonna be where we're gonna have to be at the grid monetization level. So we think that that's a good number and we were thinking that we would build that out to three to four chunks. So $50 million and looking at a bond portion of it. And then um, it's not included, like, as we said, in the electric uh, capital, uh, not yet, um, but um, it will be starting those increases on the rate side in 24. If we start taking monies out, then at that point, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll build it in the futures. So that will take consideration of this, but today it's not here. Right, okay. So this, this is an interesting view. I think, again, when we get to council, uh, it'd be interesting to be really clear what this is. That's an overlay on the existing budgets, like you said. Um, are you thinking of doing a section on the SCAP or, or okay. maybe in the trans? No. Oh, so we can always, of course, in the budget wrap up or the adopted staff report um, that goes to council and this committee, um, include some highlights uh, with any additional details that the committee may desire. 
um, to your point, this is an overlay. So everything that's in there is already part of the balancing strategy. Um, so we don't necessarily need to change numbers, yeah. but if the highlighting and summarizing of what's included, I think is a helpful uh, way to look at the program overall. And so we can include that as part of those uh, staff report pieces. Yeah, I think it'd be good to have it in the wrap up, but just be really clear so that people don't think we're doing this in addition to what's in the budget or. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Eric, any thoughts, comments? Yeah. yeah. I do. So um, I guess you say that on the FY23 budget, that the 2.8, the second bullet point, right? 2.8 million bu budget, that one is non-salaried. Um, so what do you think when you add salary that will go to? Oh, um, good question. So at 1.5 FTE, if I'm, um, You'll forgive me if I don't actually have a, a fully loaded single staff number, but it, it's going to be in the ballpark of um, three to three point two million. Three point two million, I think. Um, I'm sure there are budget staff here who can tell me what a good rule of thumb is for a fully yeah. loaded employee FDE. <laughs> okay, and then um, you also mentioned that on the program outlook that it's going to be heavy on water and tree related programs. What was the third one? Um, there, there are water tree and zero waste programs included in this, in the work plans. So if it's going to be heavy on those, I would suspect that the people that is going to, the, the new hires, there will be somebody that will be going into your department to help with canopy, right? forester, somebody who knows trees and so forth? Well, I, I think council member that all of these proposals are in the utilities department specifically right. to, to support electrification. I think what Jonathan was saying was that as part of the SCAP, in addition to all those efforts, we have these ongoing efforts in other areas like water, zero waste, urban forestry, you know, natural environment areas. Okay. And it is the case, uh, as you know, our major endeavor in urban forestry is the tree ordinance update, uh, which we're committed to get back to council uh, in time before the break. And as part of that, even separate from this proposed budget, we're looking at what the uh, resource and staffing impacts of passing that ordinance could be. And that'll be part of the staff report that comes to council, even separate from this proposed budget. Okay, and when is that expected? June 6th. I mean, that's the tree ordinance, right? But with the staff report in terms of with the, to support yes. that program. With the staff, along with the staff report, oh, we'll talk about together. the tree ordinance. We're doing oh, everything we can to analyze what's the, the staffing resource impact of increased workload for overseeing and implementing this ordinance okay. uh, with a goal for the council to be able to consider that in time that if we, if council I see. Uh, wants to adopt the ordinance and add those resources, we could still do it before the final budget okay. comes to council. Yeah, because, you know, with the SCAP, I, I feel like, you know, there's a lot of new, there is, you know, substantial hiring in order to support it. But I want to make sure that it is um, going to be well-rounded so it's not energy heavy and then leading the natural and um, biodiversity part of it to um to nothing or very low so it should be equal parts and i just want to make sure people we hire has ability to to know about the natural part as well thank you thank you so um, I don't think we need to make a motion on this one. And um, so we did get us at places. I think it arrived during lunch. Yes. So we wanted to take a minute between these two items. Um, staff did provide an at places to the committee. Um, this has, I should take this off. 
Um, this at places is a, a standard at places that uh, staff typically provide to the finance committee as part of their review of the budgets. It has routine information in it, like the current vacancies um, across the city, um, a link to the most updated org chart um, that is posted online, as well as um, information regarding our largest contracts and our uh, leases. Um, so they're typical benchmark data points that the committee or council asks staff every year. And so um, this is just us transmitting it. It's posted to the website and the agenda um, and hopefully will be useful for the committee in their review. Yep. So I was gonna suggest, I know we just had lunch, but why don't we take a 15 minute break? People can read the outplaces memo. We could start on public safety at two o'clock. Does that sound okay? Sure. Thank you.
was posted to this agenda with some additional information regarding vacancies and other administrative um, statistics. Mm -hmm. So, um, Chair Du Bois, if you or the committee wanted to ask some questions. Well, I think we, yeah, I had the same question, which was, sure. what does it mean a waiting requisition? What's going on with that sure. stage? Sure. So uh, when there's a position that's vacant, whether it's new or um, it is existing, but someone has departed, um, a department will submit what's called the requisition. Uh, what that means is they submit to a workflow plot a process that says I would like to hire this position. And that workflow goes through their executive management for approval. Um, excuse me, the Office of Management and Budget for approval and then ultimately HR for approval before that position can be posted. Um, and those various checks are checking different things. Is the director on board with hiring that position uh, for a budget? Is it an authorized position? Is it funded correctly, et cetera? And then for HR, they're looking at things like the classification, the job duties and the like. So once that requisition is approved, um, then we move into the recruitment process, which would be the job posting um, and that kind of recruitment plan. So one of the reasons why in the at places that you're seeing on the list of vacancies is a number of areas that say um, awaiting requisition. Some of that has to do with frankly, just bandwidth of departments. Um, I can speak for myself if I put my ASD department hat on, um, director hat on, I should say, that we're prioritizing our recruitments. Uh, we don't have the capacity to recruit for all the vacancies at one time. So we have submitted requisitions and are actively working on recruitments for those that are most critical. And we'll move to the next stage um, as we move through um, kind of our backlog of vacancies. And so I think the same goes for many other departments and directors, especially when you get to the larger departments like public works or um, utilities, where you can see a significant number of vacant positions um, that they have maybe not submitted a requisition because they're targeting their hardest to fill or their most critical vacancies first, and then we'll move through um, to the extent they've got that capacity. Wow. So. Just to be fair on that, it's both uh, operating departments capacity as well as HR's capacity, as well as I don't know that any other uh, department would uh, per se be critical path on the ability to recruit. So um, Rumi, sorry, you're stepping in the middle of the conversation, but we're discussing the at places memo and question from committee members is if you look at the attachment uh, with vacancies, uh, noting that many of the positions are listed as awaiting requisition. So why is that and what does that mean? Uh, so uh, Kylie just described uh, a bit of the process and um, why a position or series of positions would be in awaiting requisition as opposed to actively uh, recruiting. So, and, and again, I was just noting the part of it is department uh, bandwidth to support and um, uh, fill a positions, but I think we need to drill down on that a bit. The other component is HR's capacity to run uh, recruitments uh, simultaneously. So um, with that, do you want to speak to the, the perhaps that bandwidth issue and or, or just even your perspective on the awaiting requisition category and why positions may be listed there. Certainly, uh, Romy Portillo, Human Resources Director. Um, there's any number of reasons why a requisition might not be acted on um, and they can change over time, but um, we often find uh, that it is a bandwidth issue. It could be either the department does not have the capacity to onboard and train and have someone work independently um, and so it might be a timing issue on their side. We also are constrained on the HR side. Um, we are down on recruiters. Um, the recruiter workloads are quite heavy. And as we've discussed in some other public forums um, in this labor market, we are finding that we're having to repeat recruitments multiple times. And so um, in many cases, recruitments are taking uh, longer so that and, and more effort um, to find candidates. So that is um, a factor in here as well. There may be other business reasons why requisitions are not being acted on. Uh, sometimes um, that would have to do with 
Um, you know, we have somebody uh, who is working out a class, meaning that they have another home department, but because they have the uh, capacity or ability to do um, higher level work and can do the work more productively and quickly than bringing someone on board, that is sometimes a solution. Um, there are other times where the, um, because of various reasons in the department, rather than onboarding someone, the, the funding for that position can be used for contract services. Um, and we sometimes staff in other ways, such as bringing a retiree back. Um, so there's lots of different ways that we can staff. And it's very difficult for us to um, take all of the requisitions and have them sort of at the, you know, at the start line um, and, and being filled. So um, it is all of part of a, um, you know, a business puzzle in terms of how to um, stage the work uh, and match the work to the, uh, you know, the capacity to have people trained and productive. So on, with the way the city hires, um, say a department manager, they can't just post all their positions. And then if they don't see any resumes that they're interested in, uh, just kind of keep waiting. It sounds like you have to recruit for a fixed period of time and then you take all the applicants and uh, it depends on the position. There really isn't a one size fits all. It, it depends on whether um, it's a represented position, meaning there may be some union rules on, on there's some merit rules that apply in terms of how long the positions are uh, posted. Uh, right now, if it's an internal posting for uh, the majority of the positions, it's five days. And in other cases, it's a minimum of two weeks. Um, but we also have other uh, posting methods, such as something called continuous, which is where it just stays open, um, you know, open-ended until we find an adequate pool of candidates or yeah. uh, someone to hire. So there's different ways to do, uh, to, to, you know, depending on the position. Um, they, uh, we have, I do want to mention that we have been working with departments to expedite hiring. And so we have increased our capacity to hire by decentralizing a lot of the hiring. So we don't have everything coming through the same chute. We do have some yeah. spread in departments, some in HR, and we have increased our capacity to hire. Yeah, so I'll just use Kylie as an example since she's here. Like you said, you, you, you're kind of too busy. You can't recruit for all your positions at once. But if you could post them continuously and you just saw an awesome resume maybe for a lower priority position, then you could maybe react to that, but it sounds like you have to juggle. Well, them. so let me be honest. No, yeah. she can't. And no individual in the organization will have the ability to say, oh, I just got the perfect candidate yeah. and I'm going to close that recruitment because of the checks and balances that are inherent in our system. There's an arm's length relationship between yeah. the hiring manager and many of the steps involved with the hiring. That's what I was trying to get to. Like, yeah. is that getting in our way of with so many open positions, you really have to have the time to focus on that recruitment as a manager. With, again, with those checks and balances that are built into our system to avoid bias or um, ensure that uh, basically there's, there's uh, opportunity uh, for a wide uh, pool of candidates uh, to apply for put in yeah. for the jobs. If I could add to that, we are in a merit system. And so the way that, um, you know, it's required for these government positions is that we do have to evaluate all candidates um, on their um, experience and everything that's presented in their application. And so, uh, you know, every candidate, every applicant who applies is evaluated and all who are similarly situated must be treated in the same manner. Okay, and then, but also you can't consider prior salary history, um, uh, certainly not gender, certainly not age. You know, there are a number of uh, um, sort of third rails that are built into the system, which is again, exactly why, you know, uh, Chair Du Bois, as you pointed out, in some ways it, it certainly impedes our ability to act quickly uh, and has been uh, quite frankly, slowed down by design, uh, by, by um, in, integrating a variety of sort of, yeah, I call it, yeah, limits on uh, degrees of freedom. <laughs> no. Yeah, and right. I should explain by similarly situated, what I mean is if there's comparable experience, we're obligated to, for example, bring, you know, a, the, you know all candidates with similar experience in for uh, evaluation or run them through the same level of testing um, 
uh, you know, screening and that type of thing. So, yes. And so operationally, when you layer on all of those aspects, it's difficult for hiring managers to pull themselves away from their day-to-day -day work to be constantly looking at, oh, that's a great resume and trying to go through those processes. So from a scale perspective, we'll, you know, we'll set timeframes and we'll check them at a certain time frame and, and move through those processes. Um, but, you know, as a hiring manager, we are, for myself, uh, producing a budget, working on ballot measures, working on a lease negotiation, you know, there's a number of other things. And so having that ability to every day kind of be checking, do we have a great candidate, isn't really scalable, frankly, um, to go through those processes. And sometimes some of my staff have actually chosen as hiring managers, um, the training issue, as uh, Director Portillo just said, if you've already got two, three, four new staff on board, you spend a lot of time training, which is great, um, but their capacity to continue to add new staff and the time that would it would take to train is another um, bandwidth issue um, because they still have their normal work that they are trying to get out on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think it's a confluence of all of these things. And, and so, no, I can't just go and be like, well, that's perfect, done. Um, and, and we also counsel hiring managers at not to put out their announcements unless they're ready to act on them. It's very frustrating to candidates and especially if good ones come in uh, and are ready and then we don't respond to them, you know, it, it um, doesn't reflect well on us. So we do tell them to be ready to hire and onboard when you're posting. Yeah. So the other part of this, was uh, a little bit of a discussion about, um, I think, how much money could be saved if we slowed hiring to match it to funding. And again, based on everything I'm hearing, it feels like we should be hiring as fast as we can, and we're not gonna we're not gonna get ahead of ourselves. It seems we're not. If we landed some awesome recruiters, and we suddenly could hire ahead of budget. It just doesn't sound like it's gonna happen. So. I don't even think we should worry about it. <laughs> I think all staff agree with that. <laughs> problem we'd love to have, but not a problem. Man, man, I'm impressed that we can hire anybody. <laughs> um, if, if I understand this, this right, then. So we're trying to figure out what awaiting requisition means. It sounds like, you know, there might be a, that, that might cover a lot of territory, right? From the point of, I mean, the natural inclination is to say somebody says, "Okay, we are, we're we we approve we approve to hire this person," and then somebody completes the, the paperwork to do a requisition, and then the requisition sits around in limbo until there's bandwidth and the process to actually recruit for a candidate to fill that requisition. And both of those fall into the bucket of awaiting requisition? Actually, no, I think once the requisition is approved, it goes into active recruitment. So that in terms of the categories. But does active recruitment, if if you know if this person is if, if Kylie's got somebody in her staff or an opening on her staff, but she's too busy you know, to go and the HR is too busy and the record prioritized law and so forth. Is that awaiting, is that status awaiting requisition or is it active recruitment? That would that would be active recruitment. So oftentimes what you'll actually see is, is departments will just not put the requisition forward if they don't have the capacity to do it. They won't take the step to do that paperwork because they know what their bandwidth is. And so they're only bringing forward the ones to Director Portillo's point that we're ready to, you know. How long does it take to go from you're authorized to go hire somebody versus the rec is complete? Oh, uh, probably days or months or weeks. No, no, no. Um, I would ask Director Portillo on that, but my guess is is you could get it done in a week. It's pretty fast. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. to approve a rec. Oh, there's yeah. just some basic things that we're checking. Is it a budgeted position? Okay. You know, is it vacant in the okay. system? Make sure there's. So if you don't have bandwidth to, to to go through the process, then you don't do the rec because when it comes time to do the rec, you can do it quickly. That's correct. So most of these awaiting requisitions, should we conclude that's okay, there's just not bandwidth to go through the process right now? Is that how we should interpret it? That's the more likely scenario. Yeah. Um, but again, there could be, you know, there are other reasons like, um, you know, 
being used for contract work or that type of thing. Oh, okay. But yeah, yes, but that is the more likely reason. Okay. I mean, maybe, maybe when we get to the HR operating discussion, it seems like <laughs> that's a good performance metric, like the time from positions authorizing to getting somebody in the seat. Um, Cause again, I think council doesn't have a very good idea. Okay, we approved these heads mid-year last year or whatever, and you know, they're still not there. Yeah, there, um, so. that is a reporting measure uh, under HR that we do have. Okay. I think the um, thing that's, uh, well, I, you know, what, what is, there is such a range of positions that we hire for in so many business lines that, um, you know, that, that the number includes, for example, police officer hiring in addition to engineers or positions that might get filled quickly. But uh, I think the idea is that it, we do run an average and report on it. Um, there's another one in here, um, acting assignment. So is that somebody that is already um, an employee and acting? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> As someone who is currently doing that, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's moving through that review queue. So the department has submitted it, likely an analyst in the department or a hiring manager. It's moving through the department's executive leadership. Every director has to approve it, HR and OMB's review. So that's what it means in progress is that we're working through those review queues. Okay, so that's your, that's your week. Yeah. So first is awaiting requisition, then requisition progress, then active recruitment. Active recruitment. Mm -hmm. yeah. We can put a key on this next time. <laughs> so are you guys okay if we move on to public safety? So thank you guys for your patience. We got this at place memo and as you can tell, we had a lot of questions. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and move on. I think we're starting with fire. So, and Chair, I don't know if you have a preference. Uh, the chiefs were actually planning on running through all three departments. Um, and then doing Q and A, if that works from a PowerPoint perspective. Sure. Wonderful, thank you. And then I can start off with a quick overview on the first slide, just to kind of set how these operating sections are gonna run. <clears throat> so we're, um, as we said before, presenting um, as service areas. So this is the public safety service area. So what we've tried to summarize on this slide is the total budget from last year in the general fund, the total budget this year in the general fund, uh, the number of FTEs last year and this year, and then the change from last year to this year. <clears throat> and then at the bottom, you'll see the revenues and expenses for all three departments in this section. Um, some things to note um, in the operating budget, um, as we've discussed before, there were some positions that have been added uh, as part of the mid-year and the Q1 reports. Uh, if you look at the position tables in the department sections in the budget, we've tried to footnote which positions were added previously. They have also been noted in the, uh, what do we call them, the reconciliation tables. So when you're moving from last year's budget to this year's and you're looking at all of the changes, um, those positions have been highlighted in there as base additions because they were approved and they're just getting kind of rolled into the budget for this year. Um, I think that's it in terms of kind of ground setting. So I'll turn it over to the fire chief to talk about fire. Is there a preference with or without? Okay, good. All right, I'm taking it off. <laughs> Good afternoon, members of the Finance Committee. Um, I wanna thank you for the support you've uh, given the fire department um, over the last year, and uh, also for this opportunity to uh, present to you our budget request. I would also um, like to give some context to the request this year. Um, I would like to acknowledge the members of the fire department uh, for their exceptional commitment to service provided to this community over the last two years, challenging years. And I say challenging because of the obvious, um, you know, the unavoidable impacts to, to the pandemic. Although we were all affected, uh, the challenges before us were a bit different when it comes to the fire service. We cannot change our hours of operation. We cannot choose the emergencies we wanna to respond to and we can't reduce the amount of calls that we respond to. 
regardless of our staffing levels, fatigue, or availability. In addition to those challenges, we're matched with uh, or we're presented with unprecedented mandatory staffing, meaning that you know we have to fill positions and when those vacancies are there, even though when people wanna go home, we have to make sure that they stay, fill those seats to serve this community. And uh, we also have been dealing with the unprecedented uh, retention concerns that are ongoing. But with all that said, uh, we have been able to achieve our, um, our goals with response standards. And while our firefighters are maintaining a constant rate of readiness to respond to any and every emergency, the fire department's management team have worked tireless, tirelessly to ensure that we met and in many cases exceed our standards. For example, we modified our deployment model to eliminate the browning out of Fire Station 2 and improve our working conditions online. We were awarded the SAFER grant that restored five firefighters that were previously eliminated in previously budget, uh, budgeted uh, fiscal years. And we partnered with the county uh, to provide vaccines to homebound residents, and we followed up with those that needed boosters. We also contracted with County Fire, Los Altos Hills Fire Protection District, and uh, to staff Fire Station 8 during fire season. And most recently, we launched the Fire Med, the Palo Alto Fire Med program. Uh, when it comes to fire prevention, we have say, uh, seen an increase in demand of hazmat facility inspections. They've quadrupled, went from 200 to over 1,000. And our hazmat inspections and state mandate inspections are a critical task that must be completed to reduce the risk of potential hazards. Um, I say this because I believe that our proposal helps us in this effort to restore programs and services. Um, so uh, in our proposal, we've, uh, as I mentioned, we updated the and restored the 24-7 coverage of all fire stations, no more browning out of fire station two, which is very significant in, um, in covering the city and for calls for service. We also achieved the, uh, the SAFER grant and uh, we are going to start focusing on the recruitment effort and strategies of hiring. As I said, the, the deputy chief is significant in this role. Um, and I'd like to give some context to that because when we're changing our response model, there has to be a certain amount of attention to make sure that we're able to meet our standard and effectively respond to the community. And meanwhile, that's the deputy chief of operations. And then the deputy chief of support services would focus on the other issues like facilities, um, apparatus, they would uh, recruitment, promotions, hiring, et cetera. And so without that deputy chief position, those, those uh, duties have been spread between both me and the, and the deputy chief of operations among other staff members. And um, we, we are looking forward to focusing on our recruitment efforts for diversity. As you know, we've uh, struggled in that area as presented by the grand jury report on hiring women. Um, but without this um, deputy chief of support services, we haven't been able to put the, the, the amount of time that it deserves to have an effective recruitment model that will have um, that will show the, the diversity efforts that we are trying to achieve. And then we also are looking to uh, add three firefighter trainee positions to create a hiring pipeline and recruit more strategically. And this is kind of in relation to the conversation we just had about the timing that it takes to hire a firefighter. Uh, depending on the circumstances, it could be anywhere from 12 to 18 months from the time that we say we want to hire to the time that they are a firefighter on that engine. And in the meantime, when there is a vacancy, we have to go through the procurement process to, you know, the, um, to justify and go through the process to say, we have a vacancy, we wanna hire a firefighter and everything that takes uh, to get them on board in that amount of time. Meanwhile, those are vacancies that are being filled uh, with overtime. And, uh, and also we have to consider the time that, that we're filling those, that those positions with people that are um, already working and that falls into the mandatory um, staffing issue that we also deal with. The goal is to get these trainees in position and ready to hire. So as soon as there's a vacancy, instead of waiting that 12 to 18 months, they, be, they would be ready to go, uh, trained up and fill that vacancy in a shorter amount of time. Um, and that would be the benefit of those. Um, also, we have the uh, proposed changes in the strategic, um, I'm sorry, next slide, if we would, thank you. So in the outlook, uh, we're responding to fires, medical emergencies, as we always do, trying to do that effectively, maintain our standard, 
uh, respond to medical emergencies and suppression emergencies and hazardous emergencies in a reasonable amount of time. And key point is with the right resources. Um, yeah, and in prevention, trying to keep up with the required fire inspections and state mandates. As I mentioned, you will see the addition of positions in fire prevention, um, primarily based on not only the the risk that's that's uh, the risk of doing the inspections, and also the amount of people that do the inspections, but it's also um, doing our due diligence for the companies that have the hazards. And again, we quadrupled our amount of hazardous material or hazardous material occupancies that need to be inspected, but there's also the state mandate, which includes schools, uh, um, uh, senior care facilities, apartments, uh, daycares, et cetera. Um, I'm sorry. I know we said we wanted to go all the way through. Do you mind if we ask questions? Um, I think they wanted to ask till the end. But it's up to you. I, I just wonder if you could explain how does a trainee work? Like, uh, do they stay a trainee until a position opens up? So the the minimum that we've hired in a year over the last ten years, with one exception, that's twenty twenty, has been three vacancies. So every year in the last ten years, we've hired three firefighters, uh, which is why we're having having um, asking for the three. Um, we've added. There's been years when we had as many as 14. It's uncommon, but my point is that it's not uncommon to have three vacancies a year. So that being said, we would hire three trainees, put them through a fire academy, and then we would get put them through EMT or paramedic school, time permitting. So if they finish the fire academy and they say, well, there's no vacancies for, you know, if that was a circumstance, there's no vacancies. So what are we going to do with this this? trainee that we have, and then we continue to further their education, as you know, um, or you may not be aware, but paramedics are very sought after and rare um, skills to have. And when we're recruiting now, we're really trying to push for paramedics because we do have a paramedic system where we have a paramedic on every unit and on our ambulance. And so any recruitment that you're seeing right now, is, you know, I can speak for the county and the region, the, the paramedics are the, in the most demand um, at this time. So yeah, if the, our system depends on access to trained paramedics. Correct. More than, more than most. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, and then medic school would take about another year. So again, if we don't have a big, if the rare chance happened that we didn't have a vacancy, we could just further their education and prepare them to be, to have more addition, uh, more skills to add to the, to the, um, to the force. So dumb question is, is there anything once they go through this process with us? Okay. Could you use your microphone, Sorry. please? Sorry, dumb question. Once, once they go, go through this process with us, is, is, is there anything that keeps them from going to Santa Clara or somebody else instead of us after they're done? Technically, no. Okay. Um, but, you know, the hope is that, you know, as they would stay with us, giving them a job and, you know, giving them commitment, they would. And this would these positions would have to go through negotiations with with labor, obviously. So that's why this it's a round number right now. It hasn't been redefined. But also keep in mind that when we do hire, for example, we have 11 in, or 10 in the academy now when we bring them on. We have so many, we can only have so many probationary firefighters online at one time. So we're kind of locked. Even if you said, Gio, let's hire, you know, 10 more firefighters. We couldn't, we don't have the capacity because we can't put, you know, multiple probationary firefighters at training at the same time. So what this does, if we were in that case, like we are now, we would still be able to have three trainees in the pipeline because we do anticipate, even as I speak, people that are going to be leaving, um, one's going to another fire department. Uh, we have some that have projected that they're going to be leaving by the end of the year, but it's very common that they only give us a two week notice. You know, they want to be sure for, you know, then it's their right that they're going to leave and we get that two week notice. And that's that point where we say, okay, we have a vacancy, let's hire. And, you know, do we go through all that process and the finances and resources and time it takes to hire one? Or do we want to wait till there's multiple? Um, typically, we like to have a list to pull from, but when that list goes on and on, we start calling back to see who's available, and many of the most um, viable and, um, and desirable candidates have already moved on to other fire departments, and you know, so we'd have to call and say, are you still interested? Maybe, maybe not. So we feel this is a very innovative way to not only, um, you know, to 
save overtime, to minimize the impact on our staff that has to work the mandatory uh, staffing and also um, be ready to go. And it, this will allow us to diversify our candidate pool as well, because if we can pull people in that have time uh, that say, okay, we, we need paramedics, we're fully staffed right now, and we can diversify our candidate pool and give them the training that they need. Um, you know, because if we, the more minimum requirements we put, it's gonna, the, the candidate pool is gonna look different in regards to diversity. The more that we can spread that out, it will give us a better chance to have a more diverse candidate pool. Thanks for letting us interrupt. No, thank you. <laughs> so, well, that's the bulk of my um, presentation. Um, I'm sure you'll have questions at the end of it, but I could um, pass this over to the police chief. Oh, I'm sorry. To... All right, well, the good, the good news is my, uh, my budget and my presentation will be uh, commensurately short. Um, good evening, good, good afternoon, uh, Chair and Honorable uh, Finance Committee, uh, OES Chief Duker here. Um, I'm gonna take my mask off so you can hear me a little better. Um, we can go ahead and go to the next slide, Paul. Right, so um, before I get into the, the bullet points on the screen, so just kind of a bigger picture as Chief Blackshire said, and you're gonna hear again from Chief Johnson, it's been a challenging time for us in public safety, not just the pandemic, the kind of uh, fatigue for lack of a better term in our in our respective services. Uh, it's been kind of a long march and that's not to be uh, any more Dr. Doom than I normally am, but I just wanna call it like I see it. So when we think about making budgetary decisions, as, as Gio just says, Chief Blackshard just said, we're really talking about, can we bring the right resources to solve the problem? And we, we all are kind of like a Swiss army knife here. We've got different tools that we bring, but if we don't have the people to do the job, that's the number one impediment. So um, in the context of my presentation, I'll, I'll come back to this, but I just want, I want the, the, the committee and the, the members of public to understand a little bit about how the, the pieces of public safety, the puzzle pieces, if you will, fit together. Um, the role of OES, as most of you know, and, and you recall from the establishment of OES some time ago, was deliberate to do two things. One, um, we wanted to have a department that focused on risk assessment and community engagement. So how can we pr problem solve, obviously in a, in a cost-effective way, Vice Mayor Koo was involved in the very early phases of that in the Emergency Services Volunteer Program. And thank, thank you in advance, uh, Vice Mayor, for chairing our little public safety session tonight, as a matter of fact. So that's kind of a, a little case study about the positive of what we do. And then the kind of the negative is, frankly, OES is here to fill some gaps, not just uh, between police and fire, but among all city departments. We're, uh, I was down in our emergency operations center earlier today, meeting with my staff, uh, Nathan Rainey, who's on the Zoom, if any questions come up. And one of the things we talked about is, well, you know, what, is an, what does an emergency operations center activation look like today with uh, staffing vacancies, as you just reviewed in the At Places memo, in every department and how does that impact our ability and our viability to operate in a sustained emergency, whether that's a planned special event, a major criminal activity, a natural disaster, heaven forbid, knocking on wood, another pandemic or public health crisis, all of which are within the realm of possibility. So that's kind of the doom and gloom part. I wanna get that out of the way first. The slides are a little more optimistic. Uh, we're already seeing a return to public events, uh, such as tonight. And Stanford, of course, is uh, back nearly in full swing. A lot of uh, special events, public uh, sporting events, open open to large crowds are there. So that has a major impact on on our, uh, our I'll call them KPIs or key performance. Uh, I think they're called workload measures in here, but um, that will will and is coming back to kind of pre-pandemic levels or what I'll call endemic levels now. The other things that I want to just call briefly to your attention that we're working on, and when I say we, it's rarely just OES, it's really all departments and a lot of, a lot of cases are regional efforts as well. Uh, local hazard mitigation planning, which is part of a county effort. A lot of efforts that you've heard about in the past at city council about our efforts to provide better warning and early detection of unsafe conditions, especially fires in the foothills. And then finally, and I know Chief Johnson will talk about this uh, since he's, his, his staff is the major driver, but the new public safety building is very, very essential for us since the new emergency operations center and a lot of our, our key resources will be contained in that PSB. Next slide. So that's it on our formal slides. Um, 
when we come to questions, I'll be happy to go in more, but I want to turn it over to Chief Johnson since he has a lot more to present. Thank you. Actually, in the interest of time, I'll probably keep it short and sweet as well, but uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair, Council members. You know, in front of you today is the Police Department's budget, uh, proposed budget, but first and foremost, I'd actually like to thank you for considering restoration of services for our city. Uh, the Palo Alto Police Department has always been committed to providing outstanding service to this community and the proposed restorations outlined in this year's budget definitely will assist us in supporting the council's priority on community safety. So for the past couple of years, as my colleagues have mentioned, yes, it has been extremely challenging for a variety of reasons. Uh, we have struggled to provide just the core services required to keep our city safe, but we've done so. And as Chief Blackshire mentioned, I also would have to commend the, all the men and women within the organization who have continually stepped forward to fill the staffing shortages, address the initiatives that we've put in place and really bring this community uh, back together. So it's been a, a challenging two years, but it's actually been a rewarding two years as well. So I provided the council a pretty comprehensive update last month on all the initiatives we've been involved in during the past two years. So really for the interest of time, I'll address some of the goals moving forward. Fortunately, earlier in the year, as mentioned uh, a little bit ago, uh, you actually provided some restorations to our department of several key um, positions, which were extremely beneficial. And I can update you today to say that we have successfully filled uh, many of those, including the technical services director, the manager position within the communication center, along with utilizing those authorized overhires that you gave us uh, for police officers during our recruiting efforts, which have actually been going very, very well. So the proposal in front of you, and you can go to the next slide, is really to give us the ability to um, move some flexible resources uh, for our staffing, really partner with external, external stakeholders like we're doing with our psychiatric emergency response team, which allows us to respond to calls regarding mental health crisis and really giving us the opportunity to provide a comprehensive approach to providing the services to anyone experiencing a crisis uh, when they need it. They will uh, also be looking at uh, expanding our community outreach, our training, and really uh, continuing with the initiatives that we've uh, embarked on over the past couple of years around transparency, accountability, and police reform. Uh, next slide. So the major changes is obviously uh, an increase to our training, which has become really important because we drastically reduced that in 2020. Uh, and we had really gotten to a point where we were only sending people to mandatory training. This will get, allow us to bring back some of the non-mandatory training, especially around health, wellness, bias that we can do. Uh, and that'll be very beneficial for our workforce. As I mentioned, the one FTE for the continuation of the psychiatric emergency response team, that'll solidify that position, which we've just been utilizing an officer out of patrol, but not necessarily having that backfill for. So that'll give us that ability to do that. Uh, also restoring one of our detective positions, which is extremely important because we have uh, many, many cases that need follow-up and this will bring our staffing closer to where it was in uh, 2018, actually. You know, it's interesting because when you look at from the time I arrived in 2018 to uh, here today, um, we're just kind of getting back to the middle point, right? From the staffing that we had in 2018, which ranged around 155, to this will bring us up to 134 total staffing. So that'll be beneficial. The business analyst uh, is important. The two dispatch vacancies will definitely help the communication center, bringing them very close to where they were in 2018. And obviously the uh, two positions to bring back our special projects team, uh, which will really address some of the downtown corridor uh, for homelessness issues, and especially some of the retail thefts that we've been experiencing in that area. So that's our proposal. Uh, I'm available as well as my colleagues for any questions that you have specific to my department. Thank you. Okay, thank you, yes. Um, Eric, you have questions? How did you manage to fill those positions so quickly? Uh, I, you know, it's interesting, sir, because your comment is you're surprised anybody, <laughs> uh, you know, is applying. I actually, and I'm just... Make it through. Give through the process. Well, I, 
<laughs> okay, okay. But, you know, I'll be honest with everything our profession, I'm speaking for law enforcement, has gone through over the last couple of years. When we had that hiring freeze and we actually opened it up back in what August of last year to start recruiting again, I wasn't sure if anybody was going to apply either. But we've had a tremendous outpouring. The recruiting team has done a phenomenal job attending uh, recruiting fairs and really having that personal touch and getting people to apply. And we've had very good success. So we currently have five recruits in the academy. We have four at South Bay, one at Alameda. We have four more in the building that start in June for the police officer position. And we have four more that just moved into backgrounds as of this week. So people are applying for the sworn positions. We've never historically, at least since I've been here, had uh, problems filling the professional staff. And we have found that to be the case as well. Like I said, we were, uh, found qualified candidates for the technical services director and the communication. Uh, our biggest challenge for this organization has always been hiring and getting uh, certified people off training in our dispatch center. But our new communication manager in place, she has a solid background in dispatching. So we really think she's going to be able to get that needle moving the right direction. So that's our hope is to get those positions staffed and filled so we can really um, respond to the community. As you remember, and I probably mentioned it last month in the update, you know, we have the fourth busiest communication center in the county because of how much variety it has. It's not just for the police department, it's for utilities, the fire department, um, uh, Stanford as well. So we've got a lot going on there. So important positions to have filled. Go ahead. Okay. So was that 13 sworn positions that you filled? Oh, since, uh, yeah, so, because, right, it was, you're talking, going back to June. Right. Right. We still, the numbers that you just right. said. Yeah, we actually like caught the, up very quickly. Yeah. But there's attrition. <laughs> so yeah. we've had a couple of people leave. So I think right here, as we sit here today, I think I have five vacancies. Oh. But again, we just, like I said, moved four in the background. So we're putting names to those positions pretty quick. But when I say we're moving them in the backgrounds, there's still a long way to go before they would actually be serving the community and actually even being hired, so. So where does traffic enforcement fit into all of this? Yeah, great question. You know, traffic enforcement is, that's uh, it's definitely something we had built back up uh, in 2018, 2019. Mm -hmm. That was also part of the budget reductions of 2020. We have not gotten to a position where we can restore that yet. We still do a lot of traffic enforcement, so I think that's important for the community to understand. Uh, our patrol officers still have dedicated areas that they do traffic enforcement. We still have the adopt a school program where every officer has a school that they're responsible for going to during those key traffic uh, hours to make sure uh, everyone remains safe. So we're still doing uh, traffic enforcement, but we do not have the dedicated team, nor will we probably have the staffing to do that probably for another year. Okay. And then when it comes to training, um, what are you seeing that the uh, officers are looking for um, in their training? Well, there's a lot of things. They obviously, like um, the defensive tactics, firearms training, investigative training, um, a lot. Of, you know, this this city has an amazing group of men and women that are extremely diligent on following up on investigations. So they love to go to interrogation, uh, interview and interrogation courses. So what I mean by that is for an officer to have the ability from the moment of contact, especially with somebody that com committed a criminal offense, to take that all the way to the end rather than passing it off to a detective. And to do that, they have to be trained in all those different aspects. We're also really trying to send a lot of people to um, uh, supervisor school because we've had a lot of promotions. So those are the other kinds of trainings that we're doing and uh, just familiarity with protocols and laws. So, Okay, thank you. Um, if you don't mind me asking Fire Chief. Um, Fire Chief, the... Um... Fire Prevention Bureau. It sounds like in, in one of the little boxes I read that you still main the fire department keeps the uh, administrative oversight as well as the um, as well as the personnel. Um, so you're also hiring more because there's more inspections to do now. That is correct. 
Um, so in regards to, are you referring to the yes. difference between fire department and development services? Right, right. Correct. So we do have the administration oversight. So they do report to the fire chief and uh, we cover 20% of their <clears throat> of the budgeted positions and that department and then they carry the balance and uh, so the ask is for several reasons in the in prevention we found that there are multiple um multiple not only state mandate which were obvious but as we're going to other facilities we're finding out that there are more hazmat facilities than we anticipated or traditionally have been because regulations change. And when you do an investigation, you'll say, okay, this probably wasn't a hazmat facility before, but it is now and businesses come and go. Um, so right now, the way that we have it set up is that the, the current fire marshal has an over, uh, oversees about 10 personnel. That's uh, the inspectors, uh, admin positions, also plan checkers. So there's a span of control that is just hard to maintain by one person. So the additions that you're seeing are a recovery of two positions. And we're asking for um, another position to oversee specifically the hazmat position because that's the one that's getting really out of hand and to be able to manage that with the resources we have and to the revenue that it brings in needs more oversight to make sure that we're not missing any needs that type of oversight. Uh, the effectiveness of it, the resources allocated to that, just uh, not only the, um, you know, the, the main reason is the risk but it's also the revenue. So any program that's, that has that level of risk and revenue needs, um, we feel, sufficient oversight. So what we're trying to do is build up the inspections because right currently we have two hazmat inspections, we're going to four, and then someone to supervise those four inspectors, which will give the fire marshal the capacity to effectively manage the plan checkers, the fire life safety inspector, inspectors, and an admin personnel. And that's, those are all specialized personnel that goes to specialized training in order to understand hazmat. Correct. So um, we, the chemicals and so forth. Correct. Absolutely. We have a hazmat program where we have suppression personnel of the first responders. We have, um, we have, we have first responders that are also trained in, in hazmat specialists or a technician. So that's a certain level of 40 hour training. And then some, if you go further to understand how to, um, how to respond to a hazardous material emergency because it takes it's different than responding to a fire, obviously. And some may stay on as a first responder, but some have the capacity to go into um, doing in, uh, inspections and prevention. And so they need that extra capacity to get there. And the revenues that is generated from the inspections, 20% go to the fire department or 100%? So that goes to the program, to the HAZMAT program. So oh, the HAZMAT to... facilities, they pay to have their, um, their facilities inspected. So they expect to have those uh, and their facilities inspected. So what we're trying to do is make sure we have the resources to get that done. Oh, see. So what we don't want are businesses to pay for a service that we can't provide. I see. So we're trying to play catch up on that. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so I, I, this is pretty important because this is all prevention, right? So Correct. Um, from, from, I wanted to ask about the SAFER program, the grant. Mm -hmm. Were you able to hire all five? We were. So they're, they're with us now. Currently in the academy. Oh, they're in the academy. Correct. And this grant, how long is it for? It's fully funded for three years. Three years. And we're planning beyond the three? Correct. Uh, my understanding is that they will be recovered at that time. Yeah, so as part of the long range financial forecast, we actually included the ongoing cost of those firefighters beyond the three years that the grant funds them. Mm, thank you. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, to Chief Duker, so you have 2.48 <laughs> employees, but I, I know that you say that you do support. <laughs> The other departments and throughout the entire other you know city departments um and you were pretty um during the pandemic you were on every week you know um briefing council members as well as doing the um citizen court council so um you know in addition to that your department also handles and trains a lot of the esv the uh, emergency services volunteers do you find you have enough support? So yeah, let me thank you for the opportunity. Um, right, I'm not 
coming forward in this yeah. budget cycle with a request. We we lost one FTE, a precious FTE in the last. So you did lose one. We did lose one. Okay. Um, and my intention is the next budget cycle, if things go well, to do that. But just for context and my colleagues here, my fellow chiefs understand, I felt it was more important for them to get their operating restoral before I did uh, for two reasons. One, they actually have, especially in the case of Safer Grant, they had immediate ability and capacity to, to bring people on. Uh, my recruitment cycle would, would take a long, long time. And two, without operating people, uh, I will say this as a chief officer, and I think my colleagues will agree, the boots on the ground are the most important thing. Uh, the kind of cuts that we've seen over the, the past few budget cycles, and I don't just mean to 2018, I mean going back to two decades, frankly. Uh, if you really look carefully at public safety staffing with a, with a clear mind, it, it's down. And at a certain point, yeah, we can do more with less and you can use technology and we can be more efficient, but at a certain point, you need boots on the ground. And so my concern was that that Bob and Geo, the PD and fire, get their restoral first. Uh, and then I'll take a kind of a, a second crack at it. I know there's some uh, tier two and tier three budgetary uh, uh, contingencies out there to be discussed. And if those come to pass, then that'll be the time I think is appropriate for OES to, uh, to do that. So thanks for that question. Mm. Well, thank you to all three of you and your departments. Oh, Mike. Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Councilmember Ku, since the topic of recruitments in police and fire departments both came up uh, during this discussion, I did think it um, perhaps important to connect the dots to the earlier discussion about why it takes so long to re recruit people. Quite frankly, as police and fire vacancies have uh, come up and, and authorization to fill, those became um, what we'll call all hands on deck uh, efforts. Uh, and so quite frankly, other vacancies throughout the city organization uh, became lower priorities in order to uh, complete those uh, recruitments as quickly as possible. Just perhaps obvious, but worth noting. One last question. What floor are you gonna be at? <laughs> at the new PSP? <laughs> uh, thankfully, I will no longer be in the basement. The, 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 uh, the new emergency operations center will be right next to uh, to the police and fire admin section on the on the top floor, on the third floor. Nice. So we'll invite you for a tour, and you you'll see windows that are not Microsoft Windows. It's good to see the uh, public safety construction is now above ground. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I want to ask a want to ask a weedy question if I can here. Allocated charges. What, what is that for both uh, police and fire? Which looks like it's bumped around a bit, but both seems up this year. Perhaps uh, <laughs> Director Nose would want to respond or budget staff. So allocated charges are mainly the charges that it takes to run the city. So things like IT, things like vehicle replacement, things like ASD department, um, it's the charges that are essentially allocated to the department to pay for other services. So what, what was what was the bump in public safety? Because it seems like it was sort of across the board. Um, I'd have to year. look into it, but my guess would be the restoration of the, the vehicle replacement funding. So the vehicle replacement funding was reduced as Brad, the sorry, Director Eggleston mentioned a while ago as part of the vehicle fund discussion. It was reduced for two years by about 40%. Okay. And so this year we're bringing back the replacement and that replacement cost is allocated out to the various okay. departments. That would show up on their budgets. Yep. Okay. Makes sense. Um, and then one other question um, for Chief Blackshirt. Uh, paramedic emergency medicine and hazmat inspection seem like pretty different things. So I assume it's different people doing those. So... That's a good question. So the, the minimum requirement to be a firefighter here is to at least be an EMT and some have the position of paramedic. So as they go through, you know, once they apply and have interest in getting into prevention, they still have to maintain their EMT or paramedic. Uh, so it's, so all our inspectors are either EMT or paramedic. Correct. Okay, so we might actually be diverting paramedics off to do hazmat inspections. Yeah, that's that's one of the challenges of, of maintaining that paramedic credential because mm -hmm. um, you know once a paramedic promotes to captain, right. they're no we don't have paramedic captains at the time. They're just they maintain an EMT level or pay scale. So right. 
trying to keep up with that paramedic certification mm -hmm. is that's part of the strategy. Uh, recently, we're going to send para, uh, firefighters to paramedic school right. to, to get that number up Makes if sense. we can't hire. So it's, there's a lot of focus on that. And if they go into prevention, even though they maintain their paramedic, they're not a first responder on an engine going to emergencies. So do we do enough hazmat and, and I guess fire inspections too? Do we do enough of that? Do we spend enough time doing that that it makes sense to have a specialty there that sort of doesn't pull from the other side? Um, can you frame that a different way? I just want to make sure. I do, do, do we spend enough? I mean, do we, if, if we do one of these a year, right, then then there's no point in having, but if we did, if we did, you know, if we did five of these a day, okay, correct. You, you might look at that and you go, you know, we ought to have some dedicated hazmat inspectors so that we don't pull paramedics off ambulances. Right. So right. Do we do enough of those that it makes sense to have a specialty inspector group? So hazmat specifically? Uh, well, I was thinking of hazmat, but maybe fire as well. Well, yeah. Well, based on just the requirement alone, it, it, that's the necessity right there. I mean, with their mandated inspections, they're, you know, hazmat inspections that are required to do. Right. And, um, and then we're also required to have a paramedic on every unit and on every ambulance. Do, um, do we spend, how much time do we spend doing inspections? Oh well, goodness. I have uh, the acting fire marshal, Steve Lindsay. He's on the, um, he's on zoom. So uh, he might want to answer that question. He's definitely more, uh, subject matter expert with the hours than I am, uh, Chief Lindsay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, how, many, how many a week? Know. How many a week? <laughs> so uh, we do it, the inspections that we do for hazmat. It, it covers a few different things. We do uh, facility intake where they apply and they upload uh, data into a database, which we have to validate. Okay. And then we go over their business plan, which includes emergency response, emergency contact. And once we validate that data, we go out in the field and do a field inspection. And so for like a level one facility, we allocate approximately an hour. And that's like a smaller business, um, such as like a clinical office um, that doesn't have a lot of hazmat. We have a level two facility, which we allocate about two hours of time for, and a level three facility, which we allocate approximately five hours of time for, which is a combination of emails, the intake process, and then the site inspection. So um, it's a continuous maintenance relationship that we have for our hazmat facilities. And um, then the database has to be validated so our emergency responders can access that at any time. Um, if there's an emergency after hours, we know what kind of hazardous materials they have there. On any given week, we do anywhere from, you know, our inspectors average from three to, I would say, six inspections a day. Um, we've seen an increase in our hazmat uh, facilities in town. Um, we have approximately a thousand registered hazmat facilities, some of which require more than one inspection. Many times we'll go out there to, to verify their their containment efforts and their storage and may make some proposals to follow the um, hazmat codes to improve their safety criteria and so um, right now what we've noticed is, is some of our facilities that are registered in our system and have been paying fees through the county um, haven't had the attention that they've needed and so that's why the proposal is um, to increase the um, amount of personnel to start giving the attention that they uh, rightfully deserve and need um, to get our facilities back on track and on schedule. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah. So I wanted to um, talk about a couple of different things. So on the like key performance metrics, like response times, you know, I guess Chief Blackshire, I mean, I guess under COVID, I mean, maybe we had fewer people on the road. I mean, do you have any concerns about continuing to hit those metrics? Um, that's always a concern. Um, you know, we had to redesign our, our staffing model, but the first thing we do is we have a predictive modeling uh, uh, company that we, we, we work with and we give them the model of, they use our previous call data, the resources, the location of the resources, and we tell them what we're trying to do. And what they do is they do this predictive model to say, you can achieve, uh, you know, had you been, had last year's calls with the resources you're proposing, here's what it would look like. And that will determine the, um, how, you know, the likelihood of us being able to meet our goal. Now, that being said, it's not accurate because it's using 
the previous data from the year. We don't know what's going to, you know, we don't know what data is going, what the calls are going to look like from the year to the next. And they are increasing now. We're going back to um, our pre-COVID numbers, which were the numbers that we used prior to. Um, and where we were, goodness, in 2019, we were over 9,000 calls. And uh, we're starting to scale back up there. So um, right now, the model that we have is about as lean as we can get to maintain our um, to maintain our standard. But that's the emphasis I was putting on the deputy chief of operations, giving the full attention to our model to know that when we're falling behind, that we're able to make adjustments to make sure we meet that. Because again, um, it doesn't take much to you know once people start coming in and calls start generating to start losing resources and running thin. We also have to make sure that we're, um, you know, the three ambulance, 24 hour ambulances that we have in service right now are appropriate because what, as much as we're trying to um, provide that service to the community, we try to keep the county resources out of Palo Alto be just, just because it's a longer response time. And, and the key to effective emergency response is minimizing the time that we respond. So um, that, that's the benefit of having uh, the deputy chief of operations focus on that, because I'll be quite honest, the model that we have works today. And uh, we have to closely monitor that to make sure that it works tomorrow or as, as things are changing, we have to adapt. And uh, we don't necessarily know what that looks like, but I can't put enough emphasis on how important it is that we watch that to maintain that standard. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and then, Again, I think I think all of you had like um, ratings from residents, and we're not doing the citizen survey every year, so we have a lot of not NAs. And again, uh, I'm really interested in restoring that to annually. What what budget is that actually in? The city manager's office. City manager. Okay, so we'll wait for that to come up. Um, and then on fire, I saw a big jump in revenue from other agencies. Is why why is that happening? Revenue and other agencies? Uh, yeah, like are we planning to do a lot of um, more help this year than we did last year? Not... Oh, the fire med program. So that's uh, the anticipation. So we launched the fire med program, which is the ambulance subscription service. Was that that revenue is? Correct. So it's and... going up to like a million, over a million dollars. It's sure. also the funding associated with the SAFER grant. So the matching funding coming from the government to pay for those positions is okay. also being shown there as well. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I think the charges for other service is probably the CALM, the, the subscription service. The subscription service. And but maybe I think it was the SAFER grant. It was like a big amount of money that just appeared. <laughs> right. So that's probably what that was. Um. And then yeah, I guess under OES, it looked like your workload measures looked like they were like calibrated. It looked like you adjusted back down, which was good. <laughs> we're trying to do what the pipeline does, which is, you know, the past performance doesn't guarantee future to report the, the NASDAQ and all that. But yes, uh, yeah. we have to kind of pull a little bit of lead and, and think about what, as I alluded to in my slides, what, what the return of special events and large gatherings in particular are drivers. And then, um, you know, the things that we can't really predict, but have a, have a large variability of we saw 2020, the wildland fires in particular, uh, deployments both within the Bay Area and, and some of the extended ones, like, you know, OES resources went to the Paradise Fire a few years ago and, and so forth. So those are other variables that we're trying to capture. Yeah. And then when you get to the police department on response times, it looked like the actuals have been pretty low and then our target is 90. Right. So like, do we... Think about adjusting it to like something we think. No, that's a great question, sir. <laughs> we had that conversation because historically, uh, at least you know, since I've been here, they've always come under uh, target. I mean, um, yeah, it seems like we always say ninety, but then right, we hit something right. else. And that's really something that's been discussed as far as that's in a uh, aspirational where we would be. The reality is we have not met that, so it's a matter of could we adjust? Yes, we could. But our aspirational is to try to strive to obtain that. That's what we've always tried to do. But does it mean it kind of make it meaningless? Like people feel like we're not going to hit it? Well, you know, we continually address that within the organization. And again, it, we've had several incidents where we get there within seconds. We have other incidents where it takes longer. But it's one of those things that I, I do think it's good to have that aspirational high expectation um, and to try to obtain it. And we're constantly trying to find ways to better uh, do that. 
And then with the additional PERT FTE, does, does that mean we'll be staffed 16 hours a day or 24 it's hours? It's going to change the, it'll just allow us to backfill behind the position we took from patrol. So, because that was just a position that was not um, solidified. So we just moved it out of patrol so we could actually start that program. When oh, I apologize. It's like the mute button. Now I got to answer it. <laughs> It's for people. Like oh that. my gosh! <laughs> Some days. Yeah. <laughs> gosh, I can't get. It. Anyway, the, the question is, is it'll just actually solidify the position to where it'll be permanent, and that's our hope is to keep that position locked in. I do think that's a model for the future, and I think Palo Alto is leading by example. So I'm really uh, pleased to be able to put that position. Um, in play. So, so is that available like one shift, eight hours? Yeah, right now it's still, you know, we have them four days a week uh, for 10 hours. So they're out there uh, usually uh, consistently four days a week. In order to expand that program, yeah, we would have to substantially increase. But it's not just on our side, because remember, that's a partnership with the Department of Behavioral Health. So it's a matter of being able to match a clinician. So that's why we have the one team right now. But again, I think Palo Alto is in a great position because we, as you know, we have the mobile response team from the county now that overlays and the, the city's uh, received funding to enhance uh, mental health response even more. So I think we're gonna have a really good template in place. And then I saw several of your positions are the two-year limited term. Right. So do you think that's going to make it hard to fill those? No, not at all. I think, again, you know, our department is one that there is constant attrition, very consistent attrition through retirements. So we don't think uh, that'll be problematic at all. At the end of the day, if we don't, you know, have the revenues to meet the full time FTEs at that point, I think, again, we would do like 2020 uh, potentially have to revert back to giving up open vacancies. So you hire people in these positions and you say, like, don't worry, there'll be yeah, then, another yeah, position that opens yeah, up. absolutely. Okay, cool. And then the last thing, if you don't mind, just going back to Councilmember Ku's comment, you know, you asked a question. I just want to make sure we all understand. I, I think the way I heard it is you asked what, what the officers like, what type of training they like to attend. And one of the things with that 59,000 that I, I think is really important for the community to understand that non-mandated uh, training that we really want to start sending our people to is to catch up with the initiatives we put in place in the summer of 2020 around police reform. A lot of training around de-escalation, response to mental health. Uh, as you know, that's a, a huge priority for us to make sure all our officers are trained in uh, um, crisis intervention training. So I think that's a, a, an important piece that the community needs to be aware of. It's not just for the fun things such as use of force training and everything else. It's really to bring us up to what we promised to do in 2020. And then just to close, I mean, I think Chief Duker started to hit on something about kind of long-term erosion really in public safety. And again, I think we see it here where the, comp the, the expenses are going up Eleven and a half percent, but the people only go up eight point six percent. And you know, it's something some of the council members have been talking about that. You know, public safety is expensive. Um, we over time have really kept the budget as dollar about the same, which really means fewer people. And I think you know, again, it's kind of importance of passing like this business tax this year, where potentially we can start to really increase the number of people which again, when you look at the long-term trend, it, it's kind of been steadily going down in terms of the uh, number of public safety employees. So I think that was well said, we called that out. Um, any other comments from anybody? Okay, so um, we have tentative approval of the operating budgets for public safety. Sorry, it looks like it. In, any, anything going on down there? No. <laughs> okay, it looks like you were having a conversation. Oh, sorry. No, uh, we are already uh, just looking at the schedule. Um, so no, oh. as long as the, the committee can make their tentative motion, uh, you've made yeah. wonderful time today. Uh, again, uh, having done this a few times, I think this has been a well-prepared budget. I think the, the decisions have all seemed pretty reasonable. So we are moving pretty fast through things today, but I think we've all read it and, and just haven't had a lot of disagreement. So 
Um, so all those in favor? Okay. So it's unanimous. Thank you. Can I, can, I, can I speak to my second for one second now that we already have the vote? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little back envelope arithmetic here on flogging the hazmat inspection thing again. But if you got three to six a day and one to five hours each, then that's 60 hours a week doing this. Well, that's a full time job, right? So if you had a dedicated hazmat inspector, theoretically, you could free a paramedic, right? So one person probably not material, but if it was two or three or four, it might be worth thinking about. So. so we are ahead of schedule, but um, are we gonna go ahead and start? That's actually what we were murmuring about. This is a question of, do we try to, um, uh, what's the right word? Um, rustle everybody up, muster the, the forces for the next uh, group or, or just for start fresh in the morning. And we recommend starting fresh in the morning. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so we're gonna reconvene at nine o'clock tomorrow. Well, we can, yep, we will reconvene at nine. Um, we always tell the committee where we've left off. Um, and so ultimately to, at the end of every day. So at the end of today, we've placed one item, not necessarily in the parking lot, but that the committee had asked for staff to bring back as part of wrap up, which was looking at that um, street and bringing back- um, oh, The alley. The yeah. alley, yes. Um, so we've taken that note, um, and that will be obviously included as part of our follow-up with the committee. Um, but otherwise, we will return tomorrow at nine to continue on our way. Okay. And will you summarize the, the other things that we've brought up about uh, putting in the trend to update the council or whatever? Sure. Now, or would you like us to tomorrow. start tomorrow? Yeah. Okay. We can start tomorrow with a list of those areas that the council or the committee has identified for focus highlighting. highlighting yeah good both words <laughs> both focus and highlighting for uh the committee and council as a whole sounds good wonderful thank you All committee right. thank you guys